Vortex Nation. Now, we're going to call this a listener's special. Because every time we have an episode, we're like, hey, you know, shout out to us on YouTube, Instagram, whatever. We'd love to hear back from you. And, uh, you know, one listener in particular took us up on that. And he's actually sitting across the table from me right now with his dad, who came up to visit us at Vortex. We're in the range right now. If, I, if you're watching on YouTube and the cameras are on this time, uh, then you'll you'll know that already. But uh, we had a podcast a while back that was World War II-ish guns. We had Ian, uh, Adam, Ryan on there to talk about some cool old, old firearms from that era. And Nick, across the table from me, he commented on YouTube and, and actually pointed out one slight error that we had in there, which we actually asked people to, uh, to comment on, which was when we were talking about the grenade launchers on the M1 Grand? Yep. Is that what it was? And uh, we weren't exactly sure how it was that they were firing them out of the rifle. They, they were essentially, uh, you know, back then they didn't have some kind of like an under-the-barrel grenade launcher. They actually used their, their regular barrel. We weren't sure if it was uh, how that was actually then projecting the grenade out. And Nick answered that question for us. And lo and behold, we wound up finding a bunch of other cool stuff about Nick and his dad. So before I do too much introducing for them, we'll have them introduce themselves, say a little bit uh, about what they do and how they got to this point. Again, like I said, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll probably see him right now with a plethora of incredible firearms from that era behind them. But uh, anyway, how about uh, Nick? You want to start off? So I'm Nick. Uh, both my dad and I are based out of Illinois. Uh, we've been a f- big fans of uh, mainly guns for a long time, but World War II guns, he's been collecting them for a long time. I started when I was 16, 17, 18 years old. I loved them. Um, and then it turned into a big hobby. Oh, started yeah. Started seeing everything, and that's basically what I do. And I'm always looking up something different, finding something new, learning new things. And we also both do reenacting, military reenacting, World right, War II. Right, right. Fun hobby. Um, learn more history every day. So it's always a fun thing to do. Yeah. When you're out there. Well, yeah, it's super cool. And as, as, even as we got to emailing a little bit back and forth, you're explaining some of the cool stuff that you guys got going on. And I'm really looking forward to talking about it here. And uh, Ray, so you're you're involved in this. You kind of probably got Nick started, didn't oh, yeah. you? Yeah. yeah it's, it's a good thing when you can get your son interested in what you're in. You know, I know yeah. I were always, wasn't always interested in what my father was into, uh, but he's come to know a heck of a lot more than I do. And he, he does a lot more of the research than I care to, but he's really into it, so I'm proud of him. You guys were saying you hit up gun stores quite often. Oh, yeah. How often? <laughs> I'm probably three to four times a week. It's that bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be slowing down because I got some new big purchases recently, so that will be slowing down quite a bit. All right. Yeah, okay. yeah and I, I, I've said that before, too. Yeah, I travel <laughs> for work, so I hit them all across the country, all 50 states. So that's That's got to help for sure. Now, uh, do, uh, gun, do gun stores like alert you, like, hey, we got a hot one, come on in? So I have a funny story on that. I used to work at a Shields down where we're located at, and um, I left there. Um, I now am friends with their rifle manager, and when I'm in there quite a bit, he's always has something behind the scenes. He pulls out, he's like, I got something to show you. And he's probably pulled that three or four times on me, and I've ended up buying the rifles <laughs> that day. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Oh, man. Man, knowing a guy is good, but yes. it also can be bad. So, well, let's talk about, let's talk about first, there's something on the table right now that is just incredible to even look at. And it's also essentially what we were talking about when, uh, when you mentioned in to, to kind of correct us on that one piece, which is that grenade launcher portion of the, uh, of the old rifles back then that the allies were using. Now, what is on the table in front? There's a big, there's a big missile looking thing. And then there's a smaller pineapple grenade on a little perch. What's going on here? So, um, to start, I don't have one here, but in World War I, they came up with the uh, M1 grenade launcher, which would have been for the 1903 Springfield. Okay. Basically what it was, it was a round cylindrical uh, tube with uh, multiple fin cuts in it that would go with a uh, clamp over the barrel. Okay. Very rare. They destroyed the majority of them after the war. Um, and basically all it would do, it would take same rockets, it would slide on there and they would shoot them off. Later in the war, after they decided to go to the Grand, they needed something to work along with and put on the M1 Grand that was gas gun. So they created the M7, which is how it works, is you have this pin here, which there's a plunger system in your gas tube 
that pushes that air and s- stops all the gas flow. So it basically turns a grain into a single shot rifle. Hmm. So what that does, that slides on, and then you have your locking lug that locks onto your bayonet lug, which then you would slide on either your anti-personnel gun or your uh, regular uh, anti-tank ground to whatever there's numbering system on here. So you'd have oh, five, safe. six, five, four, three, two, one. Yeah, it looks like uh, yeah, there's like a rod. That part sticks out of the barrel in here, right? Yep, it's so your barrel sticks right there. Right there. Oh. Okay, and then there's uh, yeah, there's like this shaft that's coming out of the barrel, then it has these rings all along it, and those rings correspond to what round you're shooting out? Um, rounds and distances. Oh, okay. Um, and there's also an angle game playing involved in this. Wow. So you have a lot of 45 and 30 degree angles. So you also late in the war they decided to give. The uh, little grenade launcher sight that would go on the side of the grand. Those would go on the side of the grand. So on the right side, on the other what, side. Why don't you go ahead and mount it, Nick, and give him an idea how it all so, works. Yeah, oh. here we go. All right. If you're watching on YouTube, you're going to see this all go down. But all right. So he's got this uh, He's got this M7. So it's just going right onto the front of the gun. Almost, yeah, like a bayonet would. And the plunger kind of stuck into the gas system underneath the barrel. And now from the front of the barrel is protruding this, this essentially holder for... Like a stem. Okay, and then you just you twist on that. Twist right on. now we have the pineapple grenade launcher here. This is, you said, like an anti-personnel. Yep. And, and so what they would do is then they would um, empty out their end block. So if they would have a live uh, live end block in here, they would open the action, discharge the full end block. Okay. And then put a blank round. And so this is just an empty case. Um, so what they did is they took a 30 out 6 case. Filled it as much powder as they could and just crimped the end. Basically. <laughs> well, there's a set charge. Set charge. Okay. Um, then they would do a slide that in the chamber. Um, later in the war, they gave them a little cheat sheet with different ranges, different types of rounds to fire Look at that. off. Some some dope, some grenade dope. Correct. Exactly. How about that? Um, Range tables. And then they would fire it, however distance. A lot early war, they had sling setups with tape. A lot of guys would get tape, and they would figure their angles, and then they would, from the ground, put their foot and set that angle so you would know, kind of like a mortar. Oh, you would turn your gun into a mortar? Okay. Yeah, exactly. basically. So I see, yeah. So here's one, for example, uh, fragmentation hand grenade MK2 with grenade projection adapter M1. And so they have angle of elevation, so let's say you're at 45, and the position on the launcher is six. Now, would that be furthest down or furthest Correct. out? Furthest up. Furthest so up. So furthest up is okay. six, yeah. And then uh, M1 rifles, it says range 60 yards. Now, if you go down to position three, the 45-degree angle will get you out to a range of 130 yards on an M1 rifle. Oh, like they even give it for carbines and mm-hmm. then the M19L3 yeah. rifles. Look at that. They <laughs> later dated, yeah, they did one for the carbine as well. That is so cool. That's pretty trick. And then you would you you could also stick this big mamma jamma so on there. So I'm trying to remember. I can't remember what these are. I don't know the pronunciations. I know like this would be, for instance, like the M7 round or like the M11. I can't. I think this was the M M1 M21. I don't want to miss. I don't want to mispronounce them. But they had their own pronunciations, okay. which would lead to a different chart. Okay. On the cool, cool. How did they come up with this pineapple holder thing? This is this is pretty wild. I mean, that was well, just... Well, it basically came down to, they know a man could only probably throw that no more than 30, 40 yards. Yeah. So if they needed an anti-personnel, you know, so out into the 100-yard range, this is the only way they could do it. And at that point in the war, did they feel like that was a problem that they had, that people just couldn't chuck they couldn't chuck grenades enough. far yeah. enough? Yeah. Most time when they when they use this at this range, that range, it would be an airburst. So it would be raining down the shrapnel. Okay. Instead of hitting the ground and impacting, blowing up. Yeah. So it's... Wow. Yeah. Basically, the same thing they do now. They have airburst rounds. Okay. Are these, the numbers on here, you know, you're talking about, yeah, let's say 100 yards, and you're talking about an airburst. So, and, like, are they factoring in essentially like a time of flight? So that's going to essentially go off at, whatever, 10 feet off the ground every single time? Or, I guess, how precise was this all working together? Do you know? Well, as pre- precise as can be, because I think these had a four-second I believe four-second, yep. So I, they knew... At that elevation, that distance, it would explode somewhere in that range. Wow. I mean, of course, back then they had duds, too. They could hit the ground. and Yeah. Wait, can you imagine one of those falling on your noggin? Yeah. Oh, so what was that? Oh, surprise. <laughs> but there again, it'd be a lot better than a guy trying to throw it that 100 yards. I yeah. Mean, this, this oh, heck yeah. Yeah. So that, 
that sort of rests our case that we we put out to the Vortex Nation there to, to help us out on how these things would launch grenades. One thing I would like, as you yeah. originally said, that they would fire a live round. On the original 03 model, they could. As long as this wasn't on there... And they left the grenade launcher on because you can see that tube. It's hollow. They could fire oh, through it. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, I see. So, it w- oh, wow. Huh. And, and even on, on the grand, you the still can. Except sure. that every time you charge around, you're going to have to recharge it you're oh, because you're cutting off the it, gas system. It, yeah, a, it turns it into essentially almost like a There's a, a spring gun. system in here, a little spring that plunger, plunger yeah. that turns off the gas. It's like on your kind of like your piston okay. ARs. Gotcha. If you're okay. very similar with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that's in, pretty unique. In a, in a pinch. Exactly. In a pinch, yes. I would like to note that on the back of the handy um, instruction manual provided with said grenade attachment for said infantry rifle, it is not until you get to number three <laughs> in the uh, directions under cautions that uh, it is stated never use ball ammunition when firing live grenades. <laughs> <laughs> so, All so right, so we got those. We're just about to shoot. Oh, wait, we should probably. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> more yeah. of a guideline than a directive. <laughs> right. Uh, and I guarantee it probably happened. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm certain. Uh, wow. That's that's pretty incredible. My favorite thing is the illustrations um, because they all looked exactly the same from about 1930 mm-hmm. to about yeah. 1960. So whether it was a, a, you know, a range table for your grenade or your Sears Roebuck manual or yep. catalog, they all were <laughs> the same. I, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I do have one more question on do it. Do it. So when that would fire, so we've got that little block of wood there. Mm-hmm. And that's holding. Yeah, what's what's the deal with the little block? I mean, it, it literally just looks like a little Jenga piece that's stuffed in there. S- storage, and when you're walking think, with it, your clip will clank. Yeah, and you'll hear clink, okay. clink, clink, yeah, this clink, thing, clink. So oh, this, that keeps you quiet. That, this will keep bouncing back and forth. The big pin will just bounce and bounce. This basically hmm. just holds it in one position. Um, a lot of times, they would just flick that out or shoot it off with it because once you pull the pin, this spring in here is going to burst out. Okay, and throw that the spoon off it. So yeah. So then that, that was my, so was that a manual? Did they pull? Arming of the, or did it auto when you shot? So no, you, once you put it on, you pulled that pin and you shot it off as fast as you could. Yeah, you better shoot that thing. Well, exactly. Okay. You, you were fine and to, once you shot it and then the concussion would blow the grenade exactly. loose from the mount, then, then the spoon would fly off, then it would, the fuse would start. Exactly. Oh, okay. This, this is just all part of the safety mechanism here. Gotcha. Man, phenomenal. And then, Just so cool, yeah. And that sight—that's pretty unique too. So how, how where, you said it was on the right side? So of the if gun? this would work, this was late war, late late World War II, um, Korea mainly. But how it worked is there was a little disc um, that they mounted with two screws on the side of the rifle, mm-hmm. and then this would mount on here, and it would adjust to your elevation. It's even got a little bubble level. It's in even there. got a little bubble level. Make sure the gun's level. And there's Look at that little disc, and it's got little ranging markers on it. And if if you ever get a chance to see. Uh, on M203 site, it's not dissimilar to very this. Similar. Yeah, very similar. So huh. that's pretty cool. Wow. Oh, we got we a, a microphone snag a wire here. wire snag. There we <laughs> go. We're good now. But that is that is super cool. So the stuff it, they used to come up with, man. Was I mean, this, with the technology available and, and in a pinch because you're in the middle of a war. Yeah. So was this something that like they gave to the GI and said, okay, this is going to be a, a field expedient operation. You're gonna you're gonna screw this into the stock of your M1, or is this something that from the armor would be issued a, a grand with this installed? Well, it's really no different today. Like today, when you've got a, a platoon, you've got your grenadier. He's, yeah, yeah. he's assigned the grenadier. He's got the either the M203 yeah. or the M79, whatever he happens, or whatever new thing they've got. Well, it was the same way back then. You know, you had your machine gun crew. You had your guys to support the machine gun crew. And you had your grenadier. If for some reason the grenadier got hurt, shot, killed, his weapon was taken out, all he needed was to take the M7 and the grenades. Then any infantryman would have had the grand could do sure, that. Sure, sure. Hmm. And even even if the original rifle had the sight on there, as long as he knew, and they were probably trained, what angle, what elevation, what position, he could be the grenadier. Wow. This is this is fantastic. Uh, yeah, it's cool to see these things in person. So, as far so now we talked about the uh, the grenade launcher thing here a little bit. Now, getting to the guns, we discussed behind you guys. There is quite an allotment of of firearms from this era, and you have them kind of uh, uh, worked out here as far as I think it goes: allies, axis, and neutral. If I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken, Correct. you're going to start with the good guys. Uh, then go bad, and then end on a 
uh, medium note. So what's the first? <laughs> um, what what's the first Allied gun that one should talk about when they're talking about World War II era rifles? So the first one we have, we'll start with Allied powers that went along with the U.S. We have the uh, Mosin Nagant, which would have been your Russian power. The classic. But th- wow. Okay, this, this one's is a- set up a little different. I brought this one because it's got both the features that your standard infantry rifle would have had and the famous uh, sniper rifle, the PU sniper that the Okay, Russians yeah, so have. this isn't like the Mosin Nagant you just find, you know, in a uh, creek somewhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. They just put a scope on it. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. We hosed it off. Is that the main difference between this particular, this sniper rifle and just kind of the there one that I you was. find in like every Cabela's? There I was catching crawdads. <laughs> <laughs> Lo and behold. So what they did was they took your standard run-of-the-mill, um, P- I mean, Mosin sniper. Um, yeah. Sometimes they looked for accuracy. The Mo- I mean, the Russians really weren't looking for the most accurate rifles out there. They just uh, took your run-of-the-mill. Half of them are drunk on vodka anyway. Uh, exactly. So. Um, they took a standard rifle, would drill and tap the side, the left side, mount a block in there. That would uh, then have a screw on the back that would hold the uh, scope above it. It's, a, I believe, a two-power scope, two-and-a-half-power scope. I think you're right. Um, PU scope, which has basically just a flat ver- horizontal bar with a vertical post in the center. Okay. Um, that is mounted straightly above the action or the s- chamber. So the standard Mosin, if you look at one, the bolt is a flat bolt that runs to the 12 o'clock position, so oh, yeah. to solve that problem, they would have it would be running into the scope. So they basically so they extended the bolt down to the side to clear the scope. Kind of bent it down. Yep. Yeah. I love the way that they're mounted, too. I mean, you have this little this scope here. I mean, it looks like it's reminiscent of, a, I'm in a toilet paper roll, and I, I'm not saying yep. that in like, a, in like a degrading way or anything, but it's just, that's all it is. It's just one tube. And it has these two little turrets on it. And then the the mount is hilarious, too, because it's mounted. Both rings are mounted forward of the turrets, and then the rest of it's just left to kind of come back to your eye. I mean, this is just uh, this is just classic. Have yeah. you shot this one? I have. A couple funny things about it. It's, it's not like your lefty. standard scope. When you want to go left, you turn the, right, the dial left. This is a complete opposite. So if you want to go left, you have to turn right. <laughs> oh, so in this case, you are actually, the turrets are related to actually you're physically moving the reticle rather exactly. than moving your point of impact. Yeah. And actually, oh, that's got to be confusing. This one a lo- was a little ahead of its time because it actually had a true rangefinder. If you look at that top dial, that is, that is a, a BDC turret? Yes, it's basically BDC. So, yeah, once you get the scope, when we sighted it in, once we got the scope ready, I mean set to where we want it, we t- take those two screws out and slowly reset the dial, kind of like you're zeroing out your turrets yeah. in modern day. Well, all those soldiers are used to having their uh, rear sight that's kind of correlated to, to a distance, so they basically just did the same thing, but with turrets and yep. adjusting a, a reticle. Man, this thing's this thing's in beautiful condition, too. It's a really, really nice piece. I love the fact that when we start talking about rifles, of all the rifles that are here, the first one we talk about is the Mosin. <laughs> and and, the, and the, the leather lens caps, too. How neat is that? It was a simpler time. It yeah. was, man. I think this particular rifle's even more special for me. Hornady had come out with a, a lot of am- or a type of ammunition called Vintage Match. I'm sure you've seen mm-hmm. it. Uh, Dave Emery, one of the ballisticians down there, to test this, used a Mosin PU, and they did a, a great write-up. I can't remember if it was in Guns and Ammo or if it was... It was in one of the gun rags um, with a... I, I want to say it was 1903 sniper, like an A4... Uh, a PU or a PE, I can't remember, and then a, a K98 sniper. And they did a 1,000-yard accuracy test, and this thing won handily. And uh, I just think that was the neatest the neatest darn thing. 7.62 54R, right? Yep. Okay. Very neat. It still even got the rear sight on it, the regular yeah. rear sight. Is that? Could you use that underneath the scope? You can. The scope sits that high, far oh, enough up. You can Don't hit your headphone on that side. Shoot using the actual... And I've done that before, and it's the both the iron sights and... The scope are on. Yeah. That's pretty rad. Yeah. The only that thing is. really different, they did change the front sight post. Correct. Would would be different on the sniper than the actual Is rifle. that was that to make it lower to get out of the way of the scope or no, just I think it's just, just it's just the pin. It's not the actual globe. It's the actual sight front post. Oh, just a little bit different. It, it is different. Huh. Hey Ryan, hold hold on to that. Or can you bring that up again? So loading that rifle then. Oh yeah. 
They don't have a detachable box mag, so you nope. got to kind of fish your fingers. And no in there, strip don't you? clip fed either. Yeah. It's a single load. Okay, that's right. that was going to be my question, and then a little bit Make even that. with with the scope there seems like Make that shot count. And yeah. a lot of times, what they would do um, from stories I've read, um, like especially in Battle Stalingrad, where the PU sniper got its fame. Um, they really would only load a couple rounds into the magazine because usually you would take one shot and then relocate because you basically gave your position away a lot Shoot of times. Move. So, yeah, they mainly loaded two or three rounds. They wouldn't fully load a full magazine. Hmm. And then again, you had you had support, too. Support. You would always have, a, a like, a spotter or somebody with you. Yeah. Using a uh, regular Mosin, Reg- then? Yep. Either regular That's Mosin... Our- Sometimes in rare situations, they would have had the PPSH. PPSH. Submachine gun. Submachine gun that they would have had. Nice. So my, I mentioned this before on the last podcast. I'm always, I'm always so humored by the sliders and how like (laughs) 2000 meters. Sure. Sure. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They liked volley fire. No doubt about it. They did. That, that's a throwback to, uh, trench warfare and, and, uh, earlier times. Um, I'm stoked about what's next on the, uh, menu here, which is a uh, Lee Enfield jungle carbine. We brought this one up in our last podcast because I had I actually even brought it here today just for fun. The 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 number four Mark One star here Lee Enfield that we had, but this this gun, the jungle carbine, is a this is a far, in my opinion, cooler rifle. I mean, just just to see it and the way that it was used. I mean, it's so. It's so handy. It's so much smaller than the regular it, one. It is carbine in the sense of the word, yeah. Absolutely. How long was the barrel on these? That's a great question. As, did we have a tape measure? Too short, I'd Oh, my say. bad. Millimeters? Yeah. I'll give it to you. Know you know who will know this? I would I, say too short. <laughs> I bet, our, I bet our, uh, our colleagues in the UK will know this. Oh, oh certainly. Right. Bentley and Martin, There we go. If, Mark if is listening. very accurate. 24. That sounds about right. Yeah, yeah about yeah. right. I'd say twenty four, twenty six, right around that area. Yeah. Now, when but, you say too short, are you saying for accuracy's sake, or no? Um, it will shoot fine. I haven't been able to sight that one in yet. Um, I'm actually I've shot and I've hit a human sized torso at hundred yards, no problem. With yeah. It. Um, I've only shot original nineteen forty three dated cordite through it so far, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you really can't play that too accurate yet. Boom and pop. Exactly. You never know. <laughs> they brought better stuff. I have, yeah. It was, um, but uh so that one's got some cool history to it. Um that one explain how they actually come up with that. So how yeah. they came up with that one is so what they did, they took you would have had your standard number four Mark One during the war. So what they did was uh, is they took a, this one is actually a converted number four. It's that early. Uh, it's a September of 44. So converted from a rifle that's similar to the one here like Correct. I had, right? Correct. Okay. So they would have done is they would have taken it, knock off a lot of the wood, uh, mm-hmm. shorten the barrel, and then pinned or welded this. It's pinned. Pinned? Is it pinned? I can't remember. Uh, pinned this uh, flash hider and bayonet lug on it. Which looks like a, uh, I mean, it looks like the old uh, cartoon it's reminiscent of a miniature version of the old cartoon Blunderbuss. Blunderbuss. Yeah. yeah, that kind of megaphone looking. So I was gonna, so I was gonna ask that flared out end is actually that's a flash hider, flash hider that's the or nose cone something. Yeah, okay, um, just to take down some of the flash from the okay. round. Yeah, because of that shorter barrel, you're gonna have a lot of unburnt powder. That's exactly. Flash. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then you get yeah, of course your bayonet lug. Um, also, what they did is they took um, the standard number four has one lightning cut on the top of the barrel. It's not okay. Really, um, and this one they did two lightning cuts on the side. To mm-hmm. let lose some weight as well. Then also they did lightning cuts on the receiver. Sure enough, yeah. And knocked a little bit of wood off the stock. They loosened up down here, rounded it out more. This one's been rounded out a lot. It's yeah, you can. T- yeah, it has been rounded out quite a bit. I imagine that. Yeah, yeah, it's got a different butt plate on it. Also, they put a rubber, as I say, rubber butt pad. This one being seventy years old, <laughs> it's hard as a rock, but doesn't shoot too bad. Shockingly, for nineteen forty three dated ammo. And they made this for, for I mean, jungle warfare. Jungle warfare, Where Burma, Burma, mostly Australia, that okay. around the middle, Central Pacific. Um, yeah, what they would have done is basically it's very similar like the M1 carbine. This was the British solution yeah. to it. Still shooting the 303 British. Still 303, so it's a shoulder thumper, no problem, especially on the short little handy carbine like yeah, this. Yeah, very lightweight. Um, another thing you can look at is they kept the same sights mm-hmm. as yours. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know how yours is set up. Range distance, you might have all the way up. Mine to, goes to 13. So yeah. they knocked it, this one down to 800 yards. Okay, so yeah. So they changed something nicely on this one. Nice. 
um, then still came the same peep site. Um, they also did yeah a lot of on this one. Another thing, especially for the jungles, the British did is they painted with a special paint the receivers and the barrel to help with rust prevention. Oh, okay. So this one, yeah, you can see it's got the original green, green paint. paint on it on the side of the receiver. Oh yeah, yeah. And did that did that wear off over time? Wear or? off or whoever the previous owner of this one, especially on the barrel, top of the barrel, they yeah. would have cleaned it all out of it off. It's a very tough paint, so they took a lot of time to clean it off. Yeah. If, if you look at some right. of the original World War II color photographs where these are in them, they look basically green. Yeah. 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 It's I don't I don't know that I've seen one that's been complete. Or it's been redone. Yeah, know? either redone, especially in museums. Yeah. That's yeah. mainly the time you see them. You know, it's funny because, like, we look at that and we estimate, you know, the barrel to be about 24 inches long. But for whatever reason, that gun, that bolt gun there looks so much smaller than any other bolt gun that I, like, modern bolt gun with a similar barrel length to me. I don't I don't know what it is. It's but a that long thing, stock. Is I it? Th- I think. Yeah, well, especially since, since you're keeping the same butt stock, it right. makes it look... Pretty long, yeah. Pretty long. Huh. Yeah. Now really the, the, the later jungle carbines had a different nose cone. Correct. They did change the bottom. So this one, which helped, another thing besides the date on the receiver, it tells me this is an early one plus an original one, is you can tell they took the original bottom wood and they just rounded it off. Mm-hmm. The later one's like 47 and after, or 46 and after, I'm not 100% sure. They basically just made it straight down here and basically just squared it off. Okay. That's another yeah, I think it's tell. got a piece of ebony on the end. I believe so. What uh, what's the deal with that kind of nose cone looking thing? I I don't actually understand how that could possibly be a flash hider. It's a I think it's just a blast chamber in which it contains it and allows it to possibly burn more so that it's not coming out. Oh, right at the end of it. Just I could also see that, how it could help keep the muzzle down a little bit. Like it doesn't. Yeah. Always keep that down. Hmm. Like many flash hiders, though, I can also see how it could be horribly ineffective. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Are are any of these cartridges here? The three yeah. So British? the three I I could have gotten regular commercial three or three British out, but I decided to grab the original um, nineteen forty three dated head stamp. Okay. Uh, number Mark Seven three or three British that has cordite, and we can maybe pull one open if got a pair of pliers. On if me. you got a pair of pliers, we could pull one open yeah, and pull look it at your. Look at the original cordite. Do we Before need? we, what's like, what's the value of one of these cartridges? I got thousands. We got tons of it. So cordite's fun. All right. So yeah, explain it, cordite. That, that, didn't answer, that didn't answer my question. So uh, uh, <laughs> of that round, seventy-five cents to a dollar. Oh, okay. Right? Not yeah. much. It's Interesting. Not, it's not priceless so, ammo. So is there? There's a lot of this to be had still around. Yeah, Nineteen. Yeah. Not like there was twenty stamped. years ago, but it's it's around. If you want it, you can find it. Okay. W- Interesting. What's, what's the deal with this cordite stuff then? So for people that are familiar with reloading, you got your extruded, your ball, and your standard powder. This is nowhere near it. If you're, it looks like spaghetti. Do you want me to pull it? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and pull it. Go ahead and pull it. If you look, if you like spaghetti, you will want to eat this. It looks very close to spaghetti. Seriously, well, cordite's a fir- the same explosive they used on the battleships. They had big sacks. They would run the cartridge up in the, the projectile up in the barrel. Then they'd run these bags of cordite on there. Then they'd prime that, and that's what they'd explode. Really? It's the same basic explosives they used on the battleships. The head of the, uh, or the neck of that case is kind of like, it's got those crimps Yeah, in it's there. been yeah. crimped, and yeah, most time. I wonder if, is this, I mean, it was the same stuff that would have been machine gun grade ammo. Yeah, it, it would have all okay. been, yeah. yeah. Mark yeah. 7 was used by pretty much every three or three British round during so, World War II. Yeah, whether it was on aircraft, aircraft or whether it was, yeah. Mark 7 was their main. M193 balls, what the military uses in their 5.56s nowadays. Yeah. So For those of you watching me struggle through <laughs> She's removal of this projectile. Yeah, you may have to just, just bend it 90. Yeah, I'm wondering. I wanted to kind of keep the, the, the kind of safe, but. I ain't going to explode. No, no, no. I just didn't want to mar it all up. The cordite's funny because depending on the temperature and the humidity, you can have very, very interesting results. Uh, on muzzle velocity and, and downrange ballistics. So sometimes it works really good, and sometimes it does not work good at all. Really? Yeah. What is it like? Hot? Cold? Uh, um, I think dry and hot. Dry and hot, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a, a really good story uh, out there of a professional elephant hunter who got stomped out. He made it because of cordite. Um, his cordite batch was bad, and um, I think the 303 Brit probably accounted for a great deal of ivory uh you know in the 30s and 40s it's a very interesting thing wow am i riding the struggle bus moving on <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and jump you to the keep next working one. on that we'll talk about the next rifle that's on here 
Now, the, holy smokes, this thing is about 20 feet long. Hope I pull that off to All right. people watching. So we got, because we have some bayonets on a lot of these rifles. Bayonets are pretty sweet. It's not always the case that you can find the bayonet for a certain rifle, a given rifle. Nope. Looks like he got it uh, out. So. Oh, there we go. We got that. We got the bullet out with the cordite. Got to get the overward off. What do you, wait, what's in there now? An overward. An overward. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep, that's... So as another layer of protection against environmentals and then also to assist in building of proper pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the greatest part about cordite. Boy, that was anticlimactic as well. <laughs> oh, man. They really got it packed in there. That yeah, one's that's, tight, yeah. That's, usually they just fall usually right yeah, out. Yeah, they got a couple loose strands, and it just comes right out. You may have to split that case and kind of peel it, too. It's, I've done that. I can just kind of break one of them and... Get it going. Wait for it. Wait for it. Yeah, we got tons of that at home, so it's... You know, it's fine. I'm surprised that there's not, like, a, a cordite producer for, like, vintage... I thought it was illegal, but I'm Is not 100% sure. Is it? Because of it's... Sure. I don't know. I'm not 100% sure if it's Why still... Why would it be illegal? Just because the pressure or the... You could... Oh, it, well, I could The temperature... Your... I could see your point because you get enough of it, you could truly, it truly isn't. Explosive. But if you get, you got to keep it in a controlled climate. If you keep oh, so it, it's so like the modern powders and stuff, they're they're not as they're not as explosive as people modern think powders they are. burn where yeah. this explodes. Yeah, it's, it's, okay, okay, interesting. Huh. There we go. Well, you're peeling her back yeah. now. Yeah, we we've totally banana peeled this thing. You guys can have this back when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> That's all fine. <laughs> That's all right. That's why we brought it for demo purposes. I think yeah. Did we get into cordite on the last? We I, I talked a little have bit even about been briefly it. brought up, but I remember you talked to Ryan about how the smell has that. It does. There's just, just a thing, smell. a thing with cordite that I really enjoy. It's like shooting old paper holes too. All right, there we go. You know what it looks like? It looks like that uh, gluten-free, wheat-free pasta. It does. Yeah, it does. Cordite. There you go. Cordite. That is cordite. Holy smokes! Holy mackerel! Yeah. Yeah. It you are absolutely correct. Yeah, before it gets cooked. Yeah, whole grain pasta. It's, it's like you took a little stack of pasta and cut it down. And no lie, I thought I I couldn't imagine when you guys said it looks just oh, like wow. spaghetti at first. I and was it's trying just tons of them. Just I didn't believe that it would actually truly look just like uncooked spaghetti. I, well, and I want Jim. When you look down into the case, I mean it. It there. It looks like a. It, it looks, looks like just you, like you're looking down into the bo a box of angel hair pasta. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Wow. There's oh, quite yeah. a bit of it in there. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. It's this, they gotta pack those things full, huh? Wow. I mean uh, yeah, all these individual rods and yep. then Yep. And uh I'm trying to remember it was a capstick book I was reading and he was shooting a cartridge that eludes me at the moment, loading it with cordite. He had raw cordite. He would reprime the case, he would fill it with cordite and he'd break it off at the at just below the case mouth or something like that, and then seat the projectile. And then continue hmm. on hunting. Hmm. Where does one get cordite nowadays? I don't think I, you do. I don't, I don't think, think you do. You can. It's right. pretty you much what a you, lot of guys you, do. You pull the bullet, Jim. <laughs> uh, okay. Go <laughs> right. back to the I just, Yeah, I didn't realize. How, how do you think that'll meter through a uh, charge yeah. master or some such well, thing? That, that was going to be my question. How how were the cases filled? That's a great question. I, I like to watch old videos on how stuff's done. I have not yet been able to find a video on how... If I was a guessing man, they probably this was probably a straight wall case. Mm -hmm. They had the charge in the bundle, stuck it in there, then neck sized it. Yeah, hmm. you can see why a lot of ammunition factories had unfortunate, ex you know, accidents back in the '30s and wow. '40s. Yeah, cordite, sweet, pretty neat. That is that is super neat. It's a very very interesting transition from black to smokeless powder. Cordite, boom. Yep, they're different diameters. Some of them are even different lengths. They got the hole, <laughs> yeah. they got the, they got the hole down the middle of them. That's pretty cool. That's cool. Yep. What's this next guy we got here? So we do Transitioning this one, this back one to doing rifles. pretty quick. This is what would have been used in World War One. They but they were also used in World War Two quite a bit. Oh, this is still a this is a smelly too. This is so I like to put it as like a family. Um, so this would have been the father to your rifle. Yeah. And the child would have been the jungle. Okay. So this would have been, this is a 1918, I believe. Yep, number three, Mark One, number three star. 
So, um, yeah, but the yeah, this, star is important. So yeah, the star is basically upgrade small little changes they've made. Yeah, little, how the trigger supported. Trigger supported. Um, yeah, all those little tools. Okay. So yeah, this would have been mainly using the trenches of World War One, but they were also since they couldn't produce as many as quick, and after the Battle of Dunkirk early in the war, a lot of rifles got left behind. So they had to go to these as well. Um, so yeah, this one still the same 303 British caliber, still the same 10 round box mag, still the same bolt. Far just a little bit redone. The bolt and the action area has been redone. Far more intricate than mine. Correct. Which we kind of discussed a little bit on the is that you know a lot of these firearms when they started out, they were kind of they were they were something you would almost expect out of like a craftsman, like yeah. a custom gun, yeah. or something. And then they found you know when they got into World War Two and and probably even World War One. I'm not certain, but they found you know okay we got to mass produce these things. And when we're making these, I mean even looking at this wood here, the way that it's trimmed down there, and you know mine just goes completely straight back. You know they were we got to figure out how to simplify this manufacturing process so we can just churn out guns. And this was the first British rifle to be uh, stripper clip fed. So okay. The, the predecessor of this, the Lee Metford or Long Lee was a lot longer. It was like a 28-inch barrel, if I'm not mistaken. was a uh, single load into the magazine. Still had the 10-shot mag, but it was a single load. Didn't have the stripper clip guide. So when they designed this, they wanted stripper clip guide. So yeah, they were able to... This was the first design, and then it's a high high wall or high bridge stripper clip guide, so you have all that momentum down. Yeah. And you can see where these were riveted on from production. When they went to the, the number four, it was cast into the receiver. Okay, right, right. Now, you could still... You can still detach that yep. magazine, though? You probably could if you... Yeah. Yeah, it still can... Okay. Quicker, though, to just oh, do yeah, a stripper clip. Wait. It's a lot... Of, that's why, yeah, they were never... They're so stiff to get out. But yeah, there we go. Yeah, they weren't intended to be... Sure enough. And yeah, they would have only had this one, and then they would have had multiple stripper clip chargers that would have been in their belts, and... All right. But, yeah, it's... It's funny. You go through all the work of making a detachable box mag, and then you make but a stripper... don't use it. Yeah. yeah. Another just, thing, yep. They made this one where it's just... The barrel's right at the, nip, the front of this nose cone mm -hmm. with the bayonet, big bayonet lug attachment on the front. That's cool. This bayonet is just incredibly Yeah, Yeah, that one, they huge. called that one, I believe, the pickle bayonet. I'm not 100% sure. The pickle sure. bayonet. That is a reproduction. This one is a reproduction. I haven't All been right. able to find an original one for a decent price yet. Whew. But, yeah, that's... That thing's over a foot long. Yep. and Well over. We'll get into it a little bit. Um, early, we had World War One. if you look at all the bayonets, they were all long. Yeah. All 16 inches plus long. Um, and then after the war, the Geneva Convention, um, it was uneth unethical to have this long of a bayonet. So they made all the countries shorten them. And you'll see one where one country basically disobeyed the Geneva Convention. Look, if you're going to stab people to death with a knife on the end of your gun, at least have the decency to not make it 16 inches long. <laughs> I guess, is that is that what they were saying? Yeah, because what's <laughs> funny is that would go th clean through someone. Oh, yeah. No doubt. I think <clears throat> for me what's really cool about this rig is again, we're not far away from the transition period from, from muzzle-loading firearms to repeating firearms or, right. or even, even cartridge-type um, breech loaders right. um, that were, were single-shot. But it has a lot of the uh, you know, leftover styling cues of brass butt plate, um, the full-length wood, uh, the fitment and how the wood and everything goes together, and then the large bayonet, which was, was yeah. common throughout If you looked the, at like a picture of it and you chopped off just the receiver... You, you would, yeah. You might you not know. You might not know, right? If you're none the wiser. D does was the length of the bayonet also related to um, kind of piking for horses? Because yeah. they they still use horses in World War One. Yeah. Piking. So you, a, a pike would be used to pull a man off a oh, horse like or jousting, to, practically. Uh, yeah. you'd be on the ground. Yeah, you'd plant. Uh, oh, you either, you either pull the man it. off the oh. horse or you stab the horse. Oh, a horse is coming straight at you, and you're going to just, you put your rifle down on the ground, kind of, and then brace yeah. it and just, yeah. Right. It's funny you mention it, because I think piking, I think U.S. inventory still had pikes during the First World War. Did they really? I think they were still yeah. issued. I know we still used horses. They did in the Civil in War for sure. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. Wow. What's, uh, is speaking of bayonets and stuff like that, that next one that you brought, and that's a French. Moss. French Moss yeah. 36. And this has a unique bayonet too. So this one it's like a it's like a antenna. It, it's very it's not like a knife. It just looks like a straight. So these have a funny poker. story to them. These were they say designed and produced in factories, of course, but a lot of them were produced by the resistance in basements from stories I've read. Seriously. Yeah. Because during the occupation during the occupation, especially early forty four and before, 
Yeah, you had the factories were all Nazi ran, so you had to find a way to produce it's, rifles. Yeah. Or get them in, in, brought into the country. It's very straight. It like, is. Everything is very, like, straight lines. There's not, you know, you look at a lot of these other firearms, there's a lot of curvature to them, whereas this thing is just, like, everything is straight. Very modern. Um, yeah. And th- That's I've what always, I was thinking. It almost looks like a, a little bit like a, does it almost look like a BAR? Yeah, bolt gun? I mean, you look. Yeah, it, it looks like it. It looks like it's not supposed to be a bolt gun. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and the seven five Moss is a, a really good round, actually. And I think the the rifle itself, despite what anybody has to say about anything that went on during that time, the the war and and the the people there, the rifle is pretty far ahead of its time. Um, it's it, it's very strong. It's it's well thought out. It's smooth. It's, uh, and the cartridge is really effective as well. Um, if you look at the cartridge, if it was at like a quick glance, you'd be like, "Oh, modern cartridge." Yep, There's no way. Yeah, totally. I was going to say, yeah, I was going to say through, yeah, 308. Yeah. What is a 308 yeah. diameter bullet? Yeah, I was going to say it'd be curious to look at that next to a modern day 308 you, or even a 30 out six. Like a quick, quick pass of the hand, you'd be like, "Ah, oh, it looks like he's got a 308." Yeah. Yeah. So there's a 30 out six if you want to compare them side by side. Jiminy Christmas. Just yeah. A tad I mean, yeah. <laughs> And then if you had a 308, like you said, it'd oh, that's be wild. very close. But that's it's got, wild. you know, modern shoulder angle, modern neck length, um, you know, obviously very good diameter of bullet. Um, it, it's, a, it's a cool gun. It's a cool round. And I think actually a lot of the French arms, um, starting with the Moss, well, even, I mean, even going back, uh, like we have some, of, we've got a Charlevel um, up at the, the main building there, but, but all of the modern French arms are pretty darn neat. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. That's just, you, you guys are... 10,000% more versed in this subject than I am, but I was trying to do a little bit of pre-research, and I was looking up some different firearms, and that Moss 36 was one that I came upon, and it definitely spoke to me with its, I prefer short, handy rifles. It's got a very short, yep, handy it nature. it is very handy. And it sounded like there was something special about the bolt as yeah, well. It kind of, I call it based off the infield bolt, because you can do a quick fire with it. Once you have that hand up there, you can use your... Middle finger, yeah. once you uh, load it, your middle finger can be right there and you can be ready to fire and just yeah, re- yeah. work that bolt all day. Plus, with it being a nice, short, handy rifle, you can be on that shoulder all day and be able to run it. Right. Super now, short bolt throw. It is. Very super short, nice. I don't shoot that gun a lot. It's because the ammo, you got to load it. Yeah. Um, but it is a very fun toy to take our fun rifle to take out to the range and shoot i mean when you when you look at this and, and again this this rifle was produced what were the, the dates of manufacture on on start of the uh, production 36 would be because it's a yeah. Moss 36 i'm not 100 percent sure well, when did the, the what is it the moss 49 49 so yeah f- late for late 48 49 if, if you look at the bolt itself rear lugs which i think is really cool mm-hmm. but you know it's got a fixed like a blade ejector it's got a very large but can like encapsulated and protected extractor it's very modern it is by i mean if i look at like a remington 788 it's not dissimilar right uh with the rear lugs and all that i think it's i, I think that they're a cool gun i've always thought they were pretty darn neat everything like I, I can't even put my finger on how to explain how that thing looks but it just it looks like somebody it does look like a gun somebody would make in a basement yeah, because nothing is. is overly complicated even though it's very well engineered Nothing, you know, in design, nothing's overcomplicated. All the angles and everything is very straight. Smells of lanolin. Mm. Lanolin. So now, one, what were you going to say? This one's got kind of, I think, kind of a cool story. You can see where it sat in a crate for a majority of its life. If you look on the front hand, top front hand guard and right where his cheek's about at, you can see where the wood pieces would, were sitting on the rifles. Oh, sure enough. Sat right. upside down in upside a crate. Upside down in a crate. It's, I think that's a very cool story. That on, is neat. You don't that see that very neat. often on guns. Right. Hmm. If you you can if you can find one of those with uh, German Waffenops on it that was made during the occupation, they're quite rare. Oh, Are they? no kid! So they had Nazi stamped. There's oh, yeah. pictures of German troops using the Moss. No kid. Yes. Yeah. Well, you said the Germans copied some issues, some so, aspects of it. Cool story about the bayonet. It full, it goes right into the rifle. If you want to show them how that works, yeah, it does. Ryan. You can you can put it bayonet end down into so the, the rifle. Bayonet sits up on the rifle, but also it stores away. On the inside of the rifle. Yeah. yeah so there you go. Story. You got it clipped on there. And again, it kind of looks like an antenna, not like a knife. And then you flip it upside down and boom, it just. Yeah, you think it's a gas tube. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you would. Super streamlined. Effective yeah. bayonet, though. I mean, I'm sure that's some sort of hardened steel, like like kind of the Mosin spike bayonets, too. You could run that through. Just See, and that's, that's the Geneva Convention kind of didn't like the, the, 
I'm trying to think of that type of bayonet. Spike. No, there's a name for oh, it. Oh, uh, yeah, I can't remember. Because when it's got head. the three prong bayonet, the wound won't naturally like, heal like a, blood, like a blade. Like a blood groove, kind of. Yeah, kinda. like a blood yeah. groove. Oh, that's pretty rad. And the German FG 42, 42 copied. Paired, copied that bayonet and used it on the See, yeah, once rifle. they saw the rifles okay. early, they decided to go with the short, a little bit shorter, but copied that style bayonet. If you look at an FG 42, they're not dissimilar in kind of shape, form, and function either. They, they kind of have a, a strange reminiscent. Yeah. Uh, design cue from it. That bolt, that bolt, like you said, is super cool. They bent it forward to there, be directly it's act, it was above designed the like trigger. That actually, directly above the trigger. It's very fast. Very yep. That's it's cool. right where your hand That's sits cool. on that gun. So, cool. you, so you load for the Moss. Yep. Yeah. We load for the majority. Is there is there a parent case you can use or or spin uh, down or? I, you can, I think the parent case is very similar to not six. You can make three hundred eight, uh, a lot of the Swiss, the the Moss, all out of a thirty out six. Yeah. Case. Hmm. When you think about cartridges, which are all based off of an eight millimeter, so it's yeah. thirty out six, the granddaddy of them all. But uh, Privy makes ammo for yeah. it, so it's true. Nice oh, thing okay. is we get we we do bulk three hundred eight bullets. We just use bulk three hundred eight bullets for that, and that's yeah. what the, ri- that the original bullet was a three hundred seven diameter, uh, a thousandth of an inch. You're not going to know. No, hmm. you probably get better accuracy. Probably, with it. yeah. yeah. Probably. Huh. That's a cool. That's a cool rig. I that always, is. I always really, really do like these. A lot of people overlook them because they're like, oh, French moss. What's a French moss? What's the what's little dealio that sticks off the front of so the So that's right a side? stacking swivel. Stacking so a lot swivel. of times they would have stack, had them stack. You see your old oh. Civil War pictures. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they had it off to can off to the side instead of underneath like a okay. some German rifles had. Cool. But it's a very. And cool. what's really odd about the moss on your rear sight, if you wanted to change uh, windage, you had to get that the actual elevator blade here. They had different uh, blades for different windages. Oh. Mm. Yeah, so you found out if for some reason when you shot a rifle, you needed more right, you'd take it back in the armor, and he put that different blade in. To account for uh, various shooter flinches, yeah, I'm yeah. sure a lot. <laughs> Man, the yeah. wind is just always blowing to the left <laughs> when I shoot. Low left, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's cool. Yeah, it's too, it's too bad it's kind of a spendy cartridge to shoot because it's, it's a fine cartridge, that's, it's a fine rifle. That's cool. Did they have a Moss Sniper variant, or were they just Ooh, never... I, 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 I've it, seen pictures of stuff, but you know how the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see some crazy kind of yeah. sniper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I know what I think. I don't think the French had a true sniper program like the UCL and the like the Germans and yeah. Americans had. And I don't think they had one. Not yeah. to derail too much, but do you guys have a Liberator yet? No, no. Okay, I've looked. I, I've looked. I don't <laughs> really want to. Oh. <laughs> See, but there just because just you'll want to shoot it. Yeah. Exactly. You don't want to shoot it. And so. we shoot everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's funny. Uh, speaking of snipers and then probably not sniping, but a sweet gun is the M1 carbine over there. Is mm-hmm. that what's next? That yeah, is. The I next can only yet? see the top of it. So, yeah, mm. like I said, speaking of snipers, not speaking of snipers, uh, the M1 carbine. Okay. Uh, this is a super. This is an awesome rifle. Yeah, they this, are. this this is a pistol caliber, right? Essentially, yes. Yeah, it's it's not uh, not terribly far off of like a three fifty seven or. A, look at that little guy! Yeah. Wow, you said it's not terribly far off from a three fifty seven. Well, no, like you look at the case dimensions oh, okay. and things like that. Um, okay. po- power wise, I think the old three fifty sevens got her whipped, but yeah, um, it's a pretty cool little cartridge. That's a big. That's a that bullet almost looks like it's bigger than the width of the case a little bit because you can almost see where it, it like yeah. protrudes it's, out a little bit. That's, they call it a straight wall case, but it does have a slight taper. Yeah, the, yeah. Now this this is What's, in late war configuration. The original uh, M1 carbine had a flip rear sight and did not have the the bayonet lug. Okay, and it also had a push button uh, a safety on it. This is in late 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 post war Pacific configuration. What's the story behind these rifles? So these were actually designed by a man in prison. Well, it, that's not... That's a, the rumor. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, did, he designed the he gas system. He designed the gas system, yeah. He had the time to think. Exactly. Yeah. So the gas system is different from the M1 Grand. Correct. Yeah. See, that's always mind-blowing because you have the M1 carbine, which is different from the M1 Grand, which is different from the M14, which I feel like even, even mentioning them in the same sentence, someone's going to try and kill me now. Which is different from now what we see at Springfield with the M1As. I like, but they all look so similar. Yeah, I just design cues like the the operating system, the op rod, yeah, the, the bolt, side, rotating yeah. bolt, the way the uh, uh, ejector, or excuse me, extractor works. And but no, they, it's a it's a remarkably different gun. Yeah, 
If you look at a Mini 14 taken apart, it's the exact yeah. same system. Yeah. Oh, no. Mini 14 is, is very similar. So it's a direct ripoff. Now, when you load this one, would you actually load the mag? or would yes. You would be have be given multiple magazines. Couple mags. Yep. Okay. How many, think, go, how many load into that mag? It's 15, 15 I believe. Yep, 15. And then nice thing is later in the war, they added the uh, little pouch on oh, the yeah. buttstock. So you could have a nice two rounds, right? Two bags, oh, okay. right? Ready to go right there. Several. What the, what the carbine was designed for, they thought about doing away with the 1911 sidearm. They wanted to give that to... Uh, somebody need a little bit more firepower than the 1911, like an officer or a, a rear echelon troop. They th- will give them the carbine. Hmm. Interesting. This was said to have more po- firepower than the 1911. Then 1911, correct. In Even that, it was in, in that you could shoot. Bolt. You, in that you could shoot farther. Sure you could shoot. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So this one's also cool. Um, I don't remember in the last podcast you were talking about cool companies that made them. This is actually a quality hardware. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who would ever thought of a hardware that store is fantastic. or hardware company? The, yeah. And that's the cool part about all these is during the war effort, what... Dude, that's w- the most American thing. Well, yeah, ever. what we as a nation did. Refrigerator to, companies, yeah. sewing companies, yeah. hardware companies. Quality hardware was based out of Chicago, and that's got a Rockola barrel on it. If you look at the marking of the barrel. And jukebox barrel, man. Jukebox, How cool is that? Barrel. Say what? Wait, Rockola huh? was a jukebox company. Yeah. They made jukeboxes. So they also made M1 carbines. <laughs> yeah, if you look about uh, two, three inches down from the muzzle, you'll okay. see where it says Rockola. Sure enough, right there. Yeah. Rockola. And also, this one was given to the Austrian, yeah, Austrian police. police. If you look on the bottom of the trigger guard, you'll see like uh, some initials. LGKT. Yeah. So it was lend lease after the war to the, the Austria uh, military, military police. police. Wow. So who in in today's modern landscape is still utilizing M1 carbines? Because there are, is it Korea? Yeah, I, there's I, some. There's some countries that are still, I can't off the top of my head. It's, a vi- it's still a viable arm, which is pretty yeah. interesting to me. I kind of look at it and I say, why wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. no, it, I mean, it is a remarkably little effective carbine by carbine standards. I I, I, I have a, an old customer, he's now so deceased. Um, he was from Buffalo Lake, Minnesota. His name was Clayton Stanton. And uh, he was one of my favorite customers because when I met him, uh, he was like 143 years old. And he was in the European <laughs> campaign. And I think he was on like the second or third um, wave into, into Europe. And uh, he had a 1911. Or excuse me, he was issued a carbine. And he talked about how ineffective it was in combat. And he said, you, you, you know, you'd, you'd shoot and you'd shoot and you'd shoot and it would have no effect on, on your, uh, your opponent. And he, uh, I can't remember really how far this was, this was a couple of years ago. He ended up trading his carbine to a young officer, he stated, for a 1911. And as he was moving through a particular part of town or a village, he ran into a, 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 a German aggressor, a Nazi. And he said, I come around the corner and I made eye contact with him and he looked at me and I looked at him. Neither of us wanted to die, but he was a Nazi, so I shot him in the leg and he was dead. And he was, <laughs> he was, he was talking about the 45. And I thought that was always funny. I, yeah. I looked at him like, you bet he was, Clay. You bet he was. And, uh, but, yeah, he, he, did, he loathed his carbine because he said it was so ineffective. But um, I guess that's up to some. That man has never carried anything but a 1911. Yeah, and, and he did. He bought several 1911s from me, and he was very old. Uh, very nice guy. I miss you dearly, Clayton, wherever you are. But, Especially uh, in the Pacific. They yeah. Weren't, the knockdown power wasn't there like they thought it would be. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of times your Japanese soldier would be hopped up on all these drugs mm-hmm. or not eating a lot. So they're just coming straight at you. Yep. And it oh, would take really? two or three rounds, easily drop one more majority of the time. Yeah. Wow. And that's where the thirty eight special was also found to be Correct. rather ineffective in, yeah. in battle against what Spanish it would be. American War was yeah. where it was, yeah, found ineffective. And yeah. that's when we went to the forty five. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. And if and if you know anything about carbines, this is the spring tube design. When you take it out uh, on the, the receiver here, later it issues they they had machinery that could bore a long hole in the receiver to put the the spring. Early in the war, they didn't have that machinery, so they milled out a slot and took an actual rolled piece of steel that would hold the spring and the uh, the actual the rod that would oh. hold the spring. Huh. So there's two different types of receivers on a carbine. There's a spring tube, then you've got the regular one that's got the long board hole. This is an early one that's got the spring tube. That's cool. You can still get a reproduction can today you? from yeah. Auto Ordnance. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those auto Ordnance, yeah. Inland. They yep. make like the new uh, inland is modern making. time again yep. kind of thing, Thompson's right? Is it uh, James Rivers making a – they even call it a Rocco, I think. Um, I think you're right. I'm not 100% sure, but I think you are correct. They are a cool little rifle. At, at hand, if you didn't know any better, you think it's a 1022. Yep. 
Yeah, yep. you know, you would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're, and they're as fun to shoot as they're a 10 exactly. I bet. Ammo's still pretty darn reasonable now with, with some of the modern manufacturing. Yeah. So. What, what is it again? 30 carbine. 30, 30, 30, oh, yep. 30 carbine. Okay, yep. yeah. The cartridge named after the gun, yep. practically. You ever seen one chambered in 256? No. They're out there. That's wow. pretty cool. So, uh, all right, we got two more on the Allied side here, which, I mean, let's admit, is the only side that matters. But um, it, it, as far as uh, as far as far sides go, but the firearms are still going to be cool before we get into the bad guys. So this one's a cool one. This one's based on the 1903 Springfield. This one was an 03 A3. So what they did is they took both the sights off. This was converted into a sniper rifle. So this has an original uh, Lyman Alaskan scope on it. So 1940 scope. Um, two power. Two power. Two, two, two and a half. Two and a half, and a half power scope. So little flathead screwdriver little turrets. Flathead screw. yeah. This one is actually a very sweet gun to shoot. But it's, yeah, yeah very, basically they took your 1903 Springfield from World War One, made some upgrades, um, get rid of the, the uh, ladder sight here in the back, went mm-hmm. to a peep sight on the original 03. Grab the 03 dead right over here. Where? Yep, that one right there. So, yeah, this would be your standard 03. So the, what they did is, yeah, they took the peep sight off and they took the front sight block off sure and enough, just yeah. mount a scope on Oh, you can even see, like, it, when you say they took it Correct, off, like, it see. literally still has yeah. the dovetails for a front sight. Yep. <laughs> oh, wow. But, yeah, this would have been, yeah, this would have been reissued um, later in the war. Um, like, early in the Pacific, the Marine Corps was issued the actual, the 03 with the Unertal 8 power scope. It okay. would have been super long, would have set out to here and... Those are a really nice rifle to have, but yeah, this is this was more handy for the uh, environment that they were in. Correct. This right. was a lot shorter scopes. You weren't having to bang stuff on, but yeah, this same same style reticle. If you want to look through that, same style reticle as your Russian scope. Oh yeah. Same vert or uh, horizontal bar with a vertical post. Yeah. But yeah, this is very basically an O3 Springfield scope. Not too far off from our old G4 BDC and the Razor LH. Correct. It's a classic design. Shoots pretty good though. Oh yeah, this yeah. one, this one, yeah, this is a very good shooter. There, there are still vintage matched sniper competitions that occur across the U.S. Uh, in which you, of course, can compete with this as it sits. Now, this one does have a new stock. The stock that I got on it was cr- I formed a crack in the wrist, mm-hmm. so this one does have a brand new stock on it. Okay, that's why it looks in pristine shape. But yeah, it really does. And the cartridge of this one again? Still standard thirty out six. Okay. Yeah, they basically took. The 03 Springfield that you did in the first video and yep. just upgraded some the sighting mechanism and that's that's, that's and, and nice the only reason they stuck with the out six in World War Two is because when the M1 Grant was originally being done it was what two seventy six yeah two seventy six Patterson yeah but I think yeah. MacArthur said uh, you know there's no use in restocking all of our ammo supply from a thirty out six to a new cartridge and have to incorporate that so they stuck with the out six sure. And it, I'm hey. glad they did. I'm glad they did. <laughs> it, it, it would have been a mess. Yeah. Fantastic cartridge. Still, that's like the, we'll, when we yes, get into sir. the Allied. We'll talk about. I mean, the Axis. We'll talk about yeah. the Japanese were known for doing something kind of very bad on some of their stuff. We can get into that. Oh, really? On yeah. That topic. Yeah. And Did one of the big things between the difference between the O three and the O three A three, they went to all stamp steel, fa- uh, uh, you know, fasteners and all that. Is where everything on there is milled. Your trigger guard on the bottom is all milled. Your your clamps are all milled. Your front nose. Piece you can see really? the U notch in yeah. your front band. These are all just stamp steel. So, so again, just as, that war, more effort, efficient. as yep. that war effort went on, yep. we had to figure out where to make it. Make more guns. Where to break yeah. it. Yeah, these were made all the way up until the end of the war. Yeah. Not after more the war. cheaper, no. faster. Exactly. Yep. That's a cool rifle. Another thing they had to do on the uh, standard, the bolt, they had to make some cuts on the bolt yeah, turn to down clear bolt. the scope because it is above the action or above the chamber as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's nice. Piece. Oh, yeah, because you had to, did, did you loaded this one from the top as well? This one's yep. Yep, a single load, no stripper single clip load. feed. Okay. You ever hunt with it? I do not. We don't. Uh, in Illinois, unfortunately, we can't rifle. Oh, that's right. So I we are only that. shotgun hunting. Just, in Illinois, uh, hops give it a jump away from Kentucky. You know? Yeah. yeah. So. Hmm. Whereabouts in Illinois are you guys? Central. Oh, Central. Central. Gotcha. Sweet. Very cool. What's uh? I didn't speak too soon. Did I? As far as allies go, did we? Have we gone through all the allies? So we got. We got two more. Two more. Two okay, more. Quick two more. Ones. All right. We can go through this, this next one pretty quick. No, we're we're good. I'm just trying to I'm trying to figure out. So this is a really cool one. Okay. This one might be my favorite yet. This is basically a standard M1 Grand. This one would be, this is actually. This truly isn't World War II. This, yeah, this truly, this is very late World War II into Korea. They were used in late, late war. I've seen pictures of it. That would have been the C. That would have been the C. Basically, the difference is your block, your mounting block, were a little bit different. 
Okay. Um, but this is the M1D slash C sniper rifle. Um, we don't have the correct nose cone that would be on it. We just we're not a big fan of it. Um, so what they did is they basically took your regular M1 Grand and put a receiver or a block, a stamp block on right in front of the action. Oh, were they on this yeah. one? There's yep, just exactly a piece where of that piece there. of wood's at. Yeah. Um, and just basically mount a steel block there that allows you to mount the uh, scope on. It has a hefty looking firearm. That thing just looks. All right, I guess incredibly down. beefy. So speaking to the the use of the C and the D, I mean, this is a really <laughs> like off debated thing, right? Did it get used? Didn't it get used? I've seen photos. Okay. But um nah, don't worry about it. But it's but yeah with that scope, the scope would there. come off and it would you could put it in a case. The um, ring system is is interesting to look at. It's mm-hmm. it's not like a vertically split or horizontally split ring. It's actually like rings on a like a door hinge and yeah, like a yeah. door hinge that that hinges around the scope tube. Yeah, yeah. the the original C had a, a clamp that was screwed to the side of the That's receiver right, yeah. that was made by Griffin and Howell, I mm-hmm. think it I was. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then they, they used the M82. This is an M82 scope where the D is supposed to use the M84. But okay. they did use the M82s on the early version. Yeah. Was that a slide-out sun? Yeah, yeah. Got, yeah. Oh, my gosh. That is so cool. On these old scopes, for those listening and not watching, these old scopes don't have, like, a big objective bell. They're just – imagine, like, all the 1-6s, to 1-8s, to eight, stuff like that, just straight tube to the end of the objective. And this thing has a slide out sunshade, like a spotting scope has a slide out yeah. sunshade, where it's just I didn't even realize it was there, but all of a sudden just whoosh, it yeah. just slid out and it's kind of it it's already indexed to stop and you got a sunshade right there. Yeah. And there's a little bit of progression. We looked at the A4, which is right here. This the alignment Alaska, which was a member of a civilian scope, is essentially is this, but this wasn't weather tight. Then when they made the M82s. They made them weather tight. Oh, they did. Okay. okay. Yeah. Wow. Well, the other interesting thing about that mount is it's not directly over the correct. Correct. Since this is a grand, it runs yeah, off the stripper clip. You have to have that action in block. Oh, you had to put the scope off to the side, right? What, yeah, you had what to have, a piece of equipment. I mean, that is just like a that is yeah, a, heck when of you a have, gun to behold. I was trying to think of like what it would feel, and I guess I can do it. But like when you try to look through that, it. Definitely doesn't yeah, seem... Yeah, that's why they added the cheek peed. Oh, cheek they did, pad. so your face could so your be a face little bit sits off. off to the left. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Watch your, watch your so if, if you are watching, it almost extends the stock Correct. this way. Correct. And that is a very... That, we shot that recently. That's a very smooth shooting rifle. Very nice to shoot. It's an odd feel, though. It is. Being, you have to get being used pushed to off to the side. Being shoot, yeah, yeah. Some of the uh, some of the old, or I know at least one of the old Japanese guns was it the Type ninety nine that had the weird it had the magazine it, that stick stuck yeah. off yep. the top, yeah. and then they had to make the sight stick off to the side. Yep, the Bryn gun was the same way. If yeah. you're not if you're familiar with okay. the Bryn, okay, machine gun, it was the same way. Yeah, you good, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to adjust back, my headset, but back I'd have in to action, flip it and reverse it. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. That's I, neat. Uh, maybe there should be another podcast for vintage sniper rifles. So this one's yeah. also cool. This is a CMP Probably. rifle. Oh, is it really? And yeah. made yeah. on a World War II dated receiver. Oh, yeah. cool. See, oh, with, nice. The C's were all built, designed, built guns. Correct. The D's, they would take a gun out of inventory and say, okay, we need so many D's. They would take standard receivers from World War II on up through Korea and made the gun. The only difference in the D truly is the barrel. They had a custom barrel that they would use. Okay. So this is a six-digit World War II receiver, but you could have them up into the six million serial number. Range. Wow, man, that is, yeah, that's a cool that's that's a cool gun. And then the last Allied rifle we'll go over. The it's kind of a cool guys. story. Oh, I'm gonna grab the 1917. One over. Left, left, left. There you go. So this one's kind of a cool story. This one was used during World War II. This was actually a carryover from World War One. So this is the 1917. This one's in Eddystone, but Remington was it the 1903 one. also a carryover from World War One? Correct. Yeah. All right. Is, okay. Yep. So there was two that got carried two that over. got carried over. This one's a, I believe, a night. I don't know the date on this one. Late 18. Late, late yep, September 18. Um, so this one, yep, carryover from World War II. These are funny story. These were used mainly home front. But they did see a little bit of service over in, it, I mean, Europe. Air Force bases. Air Force so bases, yeah. yep. Army or A lot of cool. The P-14, which was the British version of this, was used by the actual British Home Guard, which 
which would be like their National Guard units, a lot of older gentlemen, kids. But yeah, these were carryover from War One. Very sweet shooting rifle. Is a cock on close, just like your. Uh, I was just gonna say a lot of stuff on this gun looks similar to the Enfield. It is. It's yeah. It's, it's called a, the American Enfield. That explains okay. it. Yep. Yeah, yep. I was gonna say cock on close. The safety looks the same. The rear sight looks. Yeah, the same. Yeah, what they the did is they took the same. A Enfield, the O3, and a Mauser, and combined it all three, because it has your Mauser extra uh, bolt release to take your bolt out. That's three pretty dang solid firearms to make yeah, one out of. Very ingenious it's idea. It's all Mauser design. Now, if you look at that rear sight, what's that remind you of? Well, you guys look at that. That reminds me of. Looks just like a BAR. Yep. Okay. The old wing system. It, yeah, it looks just like off a of BAR. Yep. You. And then your safety is just like your infield safety. It is. It is. It's got a, they designed that bolt, especially with it being a bigger rifle, they designed that dog leg in that bolt so you can still do that quick bolt. Yeah, right. I like that. I like that a lot of these guns you see where they uh, – you can. It's almost like the bolt handle was a, was the last thing that they designed. Right. They yep. designed the whole rest of the rifle, and they're like, "Oh, this bolt handle's in a weird spot. We got to bend it in a funny way to get back near the trigger." We were talking before the podcast about seventeen, and it's a pretty forgotten rifle. A lot of people don't really know that they exist. And, totally, I didn't even. And um, they never get a lot of press. No. Uh, fine rifle though, and and one thing that uh, like in the last podcast I had mentioned, I'm I'm, I'm kind of a, a closet fan of sporters. Um, so guns that were military rifles that were then brought back and repurposed because it just, it's just something interesting to me that we did that as a nation. Like we had all these arms that were either captured or, or no longer needed from our own arsenals and armories. And well, instead of destroying them or otherwise, they were distributed to the public and for hunting, for home defense, for recreation or whatever. And the 17 went on to become a commercial firearm called the Remington Model 30. And the earlier 30s, were in fact just 17s with the rear sight removed um, and then, you know, sporterized. And, and so the earlier ones were cock on close. The laters became cock on opens. Um, and they were actually, oh, you is know. Is that that one? I showed you that on Gunbroker, I think, one time around. Yeah, Model 30. Model 30. Like, yeah. Yep. And so, like, that to me is, is one of the cooler ones because, golly, we had all these rifles. We didn't know what to do with them. We certainly weren't going to destroy them because it was a good rifle and you can do a lot of things with a good rifle. So let's sell them to a commercial manufacturer and have, mm-hmm. them, have them repurpose Definitely. it. Definitely. Like, that's that's, you just, that's the way to do it yep, right there. You just don't see that anymore. So, yeah, one, of the, one of the big controversies about this rifle is this is the rifle that uh, uh, Alvin York got the Congressional Medal of Honor with. Yeah. Not this particular, but this this one. Yeah. You know, depending who you talk to, his unit was originally, uh, I think, issued these, but there's something, if you read his uh, memoirs, that he, he didn't like the infield rifle. So okay. he traded it for an 03. So, but there's a lot of debate which one he actually used. Oh, okay. Mm. Huh. Another cool fun about this one, we have a project we're working on is a 19, uh, I mean, 1897 trench gun, mm-hmm. uh, shotgun, trench gun. Ooh. Another cool thing is that they use the same exact same bayonets. Bayonet. So I can just take oh, that bayonet off that rifle. Really? Say you're wanting to, say we're in World War One, wanting to sweep a trench. Say the guy that has the shotgun forgot his bayonet or something back at camp or anything. I'll give him my 1917 bayonet. He's good to go to storm that trench. A shotgun with a freaking bayonet. Yeah, it's that for turkey hunting. Oh, deal. <laughs> the best part about it when is your calling gets really good, use the bayonet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they conceived that in 1897. Got what a trench gun? And they were used. Uh, a guy I work with um, was in Vietnam, all the way from Vietnam to Iraq. He was in Vietnam, and he was given an 1897 yeah. trench gun. Yeah. No uh, joke, seriously. No joke. In Vietnam. Mossy's model, make, model 12s model in 12s. Vietnam as well. Mossy's making some new-ish versions yeah. of them. I, I don't, do they still do the same thing where you can just hold the trigger down? I can't imagine. They no. That's, no, yeah, that's, that's, a, long gone. that's very uniquely 97 and Model 12. If so. only. <laughs> right? Very, uh, very neat. Is that And that last one, this, the 17, you said that's that's also 30-06? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. So it's like a 30-06 Enfield. What's not to love? So we'll get in now. We'll get into the Axis powers. Bad guys. So this is one. Bad guys, cool guns. I this is admit. one that's very, cr- I say crudely made. I know a lot of people will agree with me. This one gets a bad rap because of its history. Um, it is a, this is a 19, or 1891 Model 41 Carcano Italian rifle. That thing looks like a, it's like the thinnest rifle we've seen yet. It's like a stick. It is. It's very thin. Um, this gets the bad rap of being the style of rifle that Lee Harvey Oswald 
killed Kennedy yeah, with. That was a 38. 38, which would have been the carbine um, with that had a little scope on top. But yeah, this is a very, I say, crudely built gun. Um, fires the 6.5 um, cartridge, which would be that one right there. Um, basically, 6.5 Creedmoor, just of the 1940s. Yeah. Six and again, five of the one that does not get good press. Correct. Good cartridge when done right. Not done right in that rifle necessarily. Yeah, this one, the bolt isn't the smoothest bolt in the world. It gets hung up a little bit, but... It's a control feed. It's a control it's a really feed. really tight extractor. So mm. it, we forgot to grab it, but it runs off a little s- clip type mechanism. So it runs off a six round clip that sits in there. In block. In block. Very similar to Grand style, but single feed. And once you f- load that sixth round into the chamber, it fall- the clip falls out the bottom here. Oh, really? It's a very ingenious. We left them over on the table over there. Wow. And so you said that the cartridge wasn't done well on this particular rifle. Is that just because, what was the twist weight wrong? No, or was just, the, the, the rifle, the cartridge by modern standards is a really good round. Okay. Like if you had a good bullet in there and you loaded it with good propellant, the, the Carcano is not dissimilar to a 260 or Creedmoor or even a 6.5 Swiss, um, but the, the rifle does it no justice. There's yeah. never been a good via, or commercially viable rifle chambered in 6.5 Carcano. Um, that Dude, these just weren't that great as far as... Like, like I shot this one yesterday at 200 yards, and I hit maybe a 10-inch piece of paper at two times out of six shots. Yeah. Look at that delicate little clip. That's pretty neat, though. That is. Yeah, and it just whoop, drops Loops off the right bottom. at the bottom, yeah. and you're ready to go. The, where do the where do the how do the rounds fit in? Here? So other rounds, they just stack up vertically, right in but there. You kind of got to you spread it apart yeah, a little yeah, bit. You got to bend it a little bit. They'll start it, and then you open it back up, and they just sit vertically, gotcha. kind of gotcha. like your strip clip you would see for your O3. If you yeah, guys. yeah. So but yeah, that neat. one's made in 1943. Skeletonized. I don't know if that was actually the, it was the intention to make it lighter weight by skeletonizing it. Not kind of helped with uh, the weight, especially, and yeah. also. Um, Easier to get rounds in and dirt. If you drop it, dirt's going to fall out a lot like less. Dirt can get in, but it can also get out. Correct. The, that one's got some cool siding systems that are kind of a carryover from the 1891 model. That this one's been shortened a little bit. Mm. Only goes out to a thousand, probably I would assume meters. Um, but it also cool thing, it's got it's flipped over and it's 200 yard battle site. Oh formation yeah. Right now. Wait, what now? So, so if you with put this it, flipped, yep. You have oh, that little a thing, a notch right there. It's 200 yard battle site. Oh, just like when you're at your straight up your war site where you're correct. Okay. Um, right now it'd be in the three hundred yard, and then every click would be a hundred meters okay. after that. Okay. Huh. All the way to a thousand, and then all the way over to two hundred. There's a lot of design cue to this. It's not dissimilar to the Mosin. Yeah, I could. Yeah, I could it see is. That. Yeah. that. Yep. Yep. Similar in many ways. It's a handy gun. It is. Yes, it is. It yep. is very handy. Lightweight. That's, that's what I like about it. It's, it's super svelte. Yeah, it's a light, slender rifle. Yeah. yeah. If only it, it was apparently done well. I don't know. I, it, it's no. Just speaking again to the cartridge and its its actual performance is what it's capable of. It's just not. Yeah. Somewhat. Uh, it's underwhelming in there. Hmm. So the next one we got is the German. This one's actually a Yugo. Yugo capture. Yugo capture that's been re-stamped and everything. But um, a wow. K98 style rifle, eight millimeter Mauser, which would be this one. We actually have been we convert. 270 brass. Yeah. Oh, and we yeah, cast yeah, our really. own bullets for because it it's so much cheaper to shoot it yep. that way. Hmm. But this is a lot of these, the early ones were carryovers that they cut down. So it was actually the K98 model K for carbine. Um, right. Doesn't look like carbine. K for carbine. Um, yeah, exactly. When you're German. When you're German. Kurtz. Exactly. Kurtz. <laughs> Kurtz. <laughs> Kurtz means short. Yeah. Um, um, so what they did is they basically took, if we were to have an original one, the original one had the early roller coaster site, the old one from carryover, but probably the most recognizable action on the market still oh, is yeah. the Mauser action. Style still action. very, very relevant. You can see how the 1917 got its carryover with your taking your bolt out. But yes, very sweet shooting rifle. But yeah, these were so many countries after the war picked up all the rifles that they would have had and just converted. So this one, yeah, this is an early Yugo. So all they did is they completely wiped off all the German markings off the receivers and re-stamped it with the Yugo crest and some other Yugo writing. There are spots you can tell. They're waffling up, yeah. Is that there are waffling up marks. I think right I here, think. I think. Right around there. Right around there somewhere. They're on the side of the... There we go. That rear sight. Right over on that side. If you guys want to take a look, there's some German eagle marks on that left oh, yeah. side right underneath the... 
ladder site. Yeah, it gives you the chills. It does. It, but <laughs> so funny with reenacting, we do both do World War II reenacting, and we see the guys do German out there. Yeah. And funny thing is, they take it more serious than we do. Yeah. So when we are out on the re- uh, reenactment battlefield, they're actually speaking in German. Yeah. Serious. They take German reenacting to a whole nother level. Now we, yeah, you can, as you can see, we do American to a, a big level, but the German, the guys do German, a whole nother level. It's, it's, it's a, you know what um, though? It's, it's an extraordinarily important part of global history. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And for most of us sitting at this table, I had family, I'm not going to say on both sides of the war, but a lot of my family hails from Germany and Austria and, uh, and, as well as Hungary and Russia and that kind of thing. And, and it is a, a remarkably significant thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I certainly don't fault anybody for it. I had a customer um, who collects Nazi memorabilia. His his entire collection base of firearms is Nazi. Interestingly enough, he's Polish. His family history was on the, you know, the unfortunately oppressed side of that uh Conflict, so he's got everything from Mausers to Mauser snipers to Lukers to P38s hmm. to you name it. But um, very nice rifles, so many fine guns, um, you know, old and new, built off of this action. This so. is what Ian's cigarette rifle was based Correct. on. Right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, you can tell it's okay. very, very. Yeah, similar. the action is yeah exactly like what Ian's has like, and yeah, just imagine taking that rifle and converting it to what he has and. Just imagine the work that had to go into that. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Yeah, and to make that lifter system that they had, the tube yeah. fed, and geez. Something about, this, something about this gun, when you look at it, it looks uh, it looks like a bad guy gun. And I, To me, I don't know what it is. And I, I don't know if it's because it's got, like, uh, when you look at the receiver and you look at the... And you look at the portion of the foreign that goes out to the end of the barrel, like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of metal and, and different angles and kind of just, like... Bad guy looking lines, you know. To it looks like the it looks like the gun that a bad guy in a movie would have. It's, I don't know. It's I think it's interesting because a rifle will set up to be self sustaining. The yes. the uh, metal disc in the back is the takedown tool for the bolt. Um, this guy right here, you yeah, know? yeah, yep. the rear, yep. The well, way. That, how would you how would you use that? So once you take the bolt out, um, basically what you do is you. If I'm not mistaken, I'm taking apart right. Doesn't it depress the spring in? I believe, yeah. Yeah. It depresses the spring. It gives you instead of putting your firing pin on a hard surface like this, you put your firing pin down the hole and you can push down and remove the cocking piece. Oh, yeah. The rifle is like remarkably over engineered. Well, it's German, so Um, right. (laughs) But but if you look at that rifle there, much like that is the modern American (laughs) hunting rifle. Yes, your Remington, you know, your Remington, your Winchester is all based right off that. That it is. That it is. No, I don't know in this in this figure in configuration and form. To me, it just looks like a bad guy again. I don't know. I don't know what it is about it. And I don't. I don't say that in like a bad way. Like, oh, I don't like it. I just say it in like. I mean, it looks really cool. It just is. Yeah. It's, and you can still get these the yeah. new ones, the Mitchells, which it, have it, a, the Mitchell Miles. You can still get them for a decent price yeah. if you want a nice shooter to add to a collection. You can. I see them all the time. Wow. They're a fun gun to shoot. Eight millimeter is not the easiest ammo to get, but. I had, a, I had a class in Very high school. Unique. I can't remember what it was called. I believe it was called independent learning, and you had to assign yourself a project that you did mathematics and, and science and a technical skill and an art and all that. And so I worked it with my my teacher. Um, she was wonderful. I, my, her name escapes me, so forgive me. I restored a 98 Mauser from, like, pickup to arsenal condition. Oh, wow. I still have the gun. And so I found a, it was a check capture, uh, recrested and all that, and, and went through everything. I had a welding instructor, uh, Mr. Gould, if you're listening, thank you for everything. Um, after hours, we pulled it apart in the welding class, sandblasted everything, cleaned everything out, re it. He had a bluing tank and um, kind of gave it a, a parked look. It was blued, but it was parked look. Um, and then um, redid the stock. I bought a stock from Numeric. Uh, I got new metal. I got all the little, you know, gadgets and and buttons and things that were lost over the time or over time, and and brought it back to like Dude, as new condition. You know what's sad is that is that to think of a kid going into his high school and being <laughs> like, "Hey, I want to redo a gun. I'm going to bring it into my shop class here at school." I mean, to think of that nowadays is like such a faux pas, but it, right. it shouldn't be. No, it w- and it wasn't. That's and, so cool. And it was. It was. It was really a very very important uh, thing for me, especially at that time. And and uh, to to credit my instructors that I had. Um, who got it? Like it wasn't it wasn't for some sort of weird, insidious motive. 
it was like restoring an old car, sort right. of. But yeah. it, it was bringing back an old rifle that was a battlefield pickup. And I have the original stock totally trashed. I mean, impregnated with oil and chips missing on it. And it looks like you would expect a new Mitchell's to come out of the mm-hmm. box. So, wow. It was pretty neat. Wow. Yep. All right. And the last axis, main. Now, these are, let me rephrase from since the very beginning. These aren't every rifle that they would have used, of course. Yeah, yeah. These are the main infantry rifle that your Joe Blow private would have had out on the battlefield. So this is the Japanese Type 9, Type 99, Arasaka. Oh, I'm super stoked about this one. So this one's got some cool features to it. Um, you're probably hearing the metal clang around. This is what's called the dust cover. And there's speculations that a lot of guys threw them out when they were, because it makes noise. The From what some videos I've watched recently, they, it's not true. They were kept on the rifle because the Japanese soldiers were very proud of their heritage, especially with having... Oh, was the Property of the Emperor. Exactly. The property of the Emperor that they looked up oh, as a god. Oh, this firearm was, yeah. Yeah, because this one's been ground, oh, unfortunately. It doesn't have the mum It does not it have anymore. the mum. Okay. It hasn't been detestly grounded. This one's not terrible. I've seen some really bad ones. But yeah, this, of course, uh, it's a 7.7, 7, so I'm pretty sure it's a 3.11 diameter bullet. Now, what is the, mu- the mum you said? So the chrysanthemum, a flower, okay. uh, was a, a symbol of, of the Empire at that time, right. and all the... All the Arasakas had that on there. And actually, I think it was all the arms. All, all, all the, the arms, equipment. Yeah. 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 equipment yeah. Wow. And then post-war, um, either as a sign, was it a sign of dishonorment or was so, it a sign of, of like... I know um, the U.S. did them. MacArthur ordered it after the war to... They ground the mums ground all off. all the mums off. So this oh, was yeah, a yeah, U.S. Okay. ground off. Yeah. So it More was... likely. It was just a flower that was on right. there. But okay. yeah. of such significance to the Japanese people... Um, that like this was the ultimate dishonor. Right. Wow. So, was grinding that often? That I mean, could you? I'm speaculating. Is that just kind of like a little kick to the you know what? Yep. Well, it, what it was, it was an agreement. I think uh, the U.S. government MacArthur made with the Empire. Well, when you soldiers surrender, we will grind the the logo off of the Empire. If a Japanese soldier knew he was going to get captured in the field or something like that, a lot of times he took his bayonet, X through it. So you'll see him out there with just an X through the bayonet. That's when the Japanese soldier did himself. This is one they did, the U.S. did on a, on a belt grinder. Okay. At okay. some kind of surrender. Yeah. So in some, I'm just trying to this. So in some ways it was out of respect that it was ground off. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. Hmm. The dust cover thing is very, very interesting. I mean, because when you pull it back, when you pull the bolt back, it looks like a very normal bolt gun. But when it's pushed forward, a dust cover, I mean, it goes over everything. Mm-hmm. It's like the original, mm-hmm. the original dust cover. And, and this it, is, it will uh, operate without it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah it sure. Yeah. Um, this is actually based off a of Mal's reaction. Mm-hmm. Nobody, okay. a lot of people don't know it because it uh, still has your bolt uh, release. I mean, get your bolt out and yeah, flock on close like an infield. Paddle bolt, bolt yep. release. Um, no crazy thing. The Japanese and Put on them. Why isn't it going to work today? Yeah, it'll lift up hard. There we go. Your regular ladder sight has what's called aircraft sights. Early oh, war. Oh, wow. So this one, what the Japanese intended for was for the soldiers. They could shoot down planes. Okay. You would lead so, it like in duck hunting. For, yeah, for those... <laughs> For those listening, I need to get he some of those. Up, <laughs> flipped up the rear ladder sight here that's just forward of the receiver and um, or the, uh, the ejection port, and then... The rear ladder sight then kind of had like these two field goal post things off to either side that now flipped down and it went straight out. So for for leading an aircraft, yeah, it's and that's early war. So yeah, you would have seen those. A lot of times you see them broken off. Yeah, yeah. they're so so flimsy. That's of, cool. Of that most of the still intact. Of most of the Arasakas that I've handled, very 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 few have both intact, if yeah. any at all. Well, and a lot of people laugh at the aircraft sights. Well, you know they're they're. Everybody thinks, well, they're going to be shooting at P-51 Mustangs. They weren't. When this rifle first came out, they're in Indochina. They're in China fighting, which would have been old biplanes. Yep. Yeah. And it wouldn't have been one guy shooting at the plane. They would did volley fire. So if they're all leading, now you've got 50 rounds yeah. going toward that one yeah. slow-moving plane. Yeah. Well, I picture it like, you know, comparing it to like maybe a modern long-range rifle scope where you've got that horizontal mm-hmm. crosshair yeah, with, exactly. you know, yeah. essentially a lot of windage data. They've just got some... Like, and, and these are marked, I think... Aircraft. One to three. Oh, yeah. One, one and two and three. I, I don't know if that's meters or what that... There's not much new in the world. It's all just, you know, advancements upon what's already existed. It's just mathematics. Re- packaged. Yeah. yeah. It's just mathematics. They know yeah. time and distance. This one's also got a cool feature called the monopod. It's kind of like a precursor to the bipod. Look at that. You that. Could oh, man. Set it's, your rifle just, down and just help shoot it. They weren't... I don't see them very durable... I mean, more. it's just, it's like, it's like a 
Better than a sharp stick in the eye. Exactly. Yeah. Better. <laughs> exactly. That it is. I don't even know how to do like what is that like uh Bent coat hanger. Bent coat <laughs> yeah. hanger, yeah. But it just flips down and then and flips it just back sits up. Right back and up in there. So this is the rifle. This is the one I was telling about um how they disobeyed the Geneva Convention. So if you look at this bayonet, it's super long. It's a large Very long. And this is over it the I think it was too. ten inches if I'm not mistaken, but the Geneva uh, Convention would call for. But yeah, this one is over that inch over that length and it so it's against the Geneva Convention, but it's a very long and crazy bayonet mm-hmm. if you think about it. It's a fighting tool. It is, yeah. Yeah, and so one one thing about the the Japanese, especially in World War II, is they 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 were all in like chips on the table were were fighting. Oh yeah, and so they were they were prepared to to fight by by hand, by arm, by whatever, and so it was it was designed as a fighting tool. Um, hell, they still carried katanas yeah. and wakasachis yeah, in, mm-hmm. up until World War II. And some of those were legacy arms, too, from, from generations past. Some of the higher-ranking higher officers, those katanas could have been built in the 14th and 15th century. You know, it, it's unfortunate that the Japanese, I know I shouldn't say unfortunate, but you know, being the, the losers in a war got a bad rap. Yeah. You know, yeah. A, a bank making cheap stuff, they didn't, because this is one of the first guns. Got a chrome bore, chrome bolt face. Mm-hmm. So they really? like cleaning for jumble. I mean... Wow. Really good stuff. And it was built. I mean, yeah, look at that gun. You got a chrome lined bore. It was built for the region, too. I mean, these are are island dwelling people surrounded by salt water. They built an arm that was with a dust cover, you know, to prevent sand from getting into the action with the chrome lined bore to prevent corrosion and to upkeep accuracy. I don't envy whoever had to fight the Japanese. Certainly. They're doing the scary people to fight. And this is, as yeah, as my dad was saying, this is probably one of the strongest actions yeah. ever. Yeah, so explain, we were talking about that, how, you know, a lot of these modern cartridges nowadays have these uh, high pressures, and people need to make rifles to withstand high pressures, and the Arasaka here was doing that a long time ago. How, explain how that So, after the on. war, um, I don't remember who did it, but the Jim government, Hatcher, I think, I, I believe so, um, the government got their hands on a ton of Arasakas and built basically test guns to try to exceed the max pressure of the, the receiver. And I can't remember the numbers. They I got think they did ex- double charges. I mean, complete yeah. double charges of rounds and, and still not getting, blow it up. I, from what I've read, I think 100,000 PSI over yeah. that. Jeez. It was incredible, the steel that these were made out of. It was just amazing. And keep in mind, when we think about the Japanese, what they're known for, it's yeah. steel. Ex- exactly. I mean, they have katanas that, again, were used for hundreds of years. Oh, sure, yeah, like their knives and yeah. swords and stuff. I, I mean, the particular grade of steel that comes out of Japan is superior to almost all things. So That's a good point. I didn't yeah. think of that. Yeah. So we're going to jump, real quick, we'll jump back to kind of U.S. Uh, um, so this is actually kind of a cool piece here. This is a 10-inch M1 Grand bayonet, but it's actually a cut-down so the way you can tell, this would have been your full 15-inch um, bayonet that they cut down to the 10 inches to uh, help with the Geneva Convention. The way you can tell, if you look at that blood groove, the blood grooves are in the, all the way to the point. Okay, yeah. The newer ones, the ones after this that were the standard 10-inch, stopped about right there. Okay. Yeah, this one you can see what they did is they cut it down and just kind of angled off the corners. What, what did the blood groove do? Oh. I'm I, glad you asked. I, Jim, don't, that was I don't know. Facilitated what, the flow. Exactly. Facilitated flow. Yeah. Oh, because if it doesn't have one there, then and then the knife itself is blocking th- st- blood. Oh, okay. Whew. Yeah, that's a. I man, I get. Ee. You think of all the guys at U.S. Ordnance and what they thought of, like exactly the minds on those guys. Yeah. So now we'll jump in. These are. Can, some, I, can I ask one quick question definitely, about the? Definitely. It was the Arasaka, right? That was the last yep. one. The it almost looks like. I keep asking questions on how to load these things, but. It almost looks like it's got like a just a hinged foreplate, like you would see on a bolt action rifle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, a lot of them did. I mean, even the original Low Three did. Uh, they all fed off stripper clips, and when you went to unload them, it ain't like you see now, guys. Just keep racking it to the empty thing. What you do, you it's a spring load. You bop, drop the bottom of the floor plate, and then you unload that way. Okay, mm-hmm. so that did load by a stripper clip as Correct. well. Then Correct. okay, it did. which mm-hmm. are, the stripper clips for those are hard to find. Yeah, airsoft strip clips aren't. They're hard to find. Hard to find. Are hard, very hard to find. So the next one we'll grab would be the... I'll give you some more cord here, too. All right. These are now neutral guys, you were saying? Yeah. So these are some... I decided, we decided to bring these because these have some cool stories to them. So what this is, this is the Swedish M96 Mauser. Um, so I, this one came around in the 1896. Um, so the Swedish people are very passionate about 
they're shooting as well. Same thing with um, Germany and Switzerland, a lot of those countries. So when this rifle is actually designed, um, it was designed for multiple countries to use. So Switzerland would, I mean, Sweden would have used it as well as Norway would have used it. Um, later, they decided to change some stuff up, and Norway went with a Craig style rifle and okay. actually a 6.5 bullet as well. So yeah, this is a 6.5 by 55 Swede. So very similar. More of your early 6.5 Creedmoor. So this one's a very sweet shooting rifle. This is considered the king of the Mausers, if a lot of people think about. Okay. A very smooth bolt. Just this is the Pro- king yeah. of the Mausers. Appropriate sized actions, too. If you look at the actions itself, they have metal where you need it, nothing where you don't. It's the right size, whereas like the 90 is a large action. But um, is this the one? Is this the one where there's like uh, now? I know one of my brothers bought some kind of an old um, Milserp rifle, and uh, he got the one where there's like a butt plate that swings to the side, and people would put stuff in there. So that probably, if I'm thinking, right, that's probably a cr- Swiss. Oh, K31. Would that be the K31? Would it be the no? Where uh, they put the soldier's oh, name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yep. what it was. Swiss. Yeah, we'll okay. get. Yeah, we'll get to okay. That, yeah. Never mind. I get my Swiss and my Swedes mixed up yeah. all the time. Um, <laughs> So this is these have this Swiss people have I mean the Swede people have a kind of a cool story and why they didn't fight in the war. Um, the reason why is their location. They were in such their location where they were located at. If they were tried to invade anybody or anybody was going to invade them, one of the other countries. So for instance, Finland. If Finland was to invade them, then more than likely Russia. I mean Germany would have invaded uh, Sweden. From the other side. From the other side. So it's like if, I, if we went east to fight, then somebody's going to come in from the west. Correct. And if we go west, and so, yeah. Same thing with the, like the Soviet Union when they invaded Finland finally, um, then worked their way up into, they would have tried to work their way into Finland or Sweden to try to get to Germany. Germany would have came right back at them. So they never, they stayed neutral during the war. Yeah. It was one of those countries... N- I don't know if I would want to be in or right because you're, you're like you're like <laughs> you're in between two bulldozers coming towards each other. So uh, yeah. I was going to ask him. Mean, Not they, a good did, place to be. Did they just stand in an outward facing circle like a group of threatened muskox? So yeah, these uh, another thing about these cool about the M ninety sixes, they were lent to uh, Sweden. Uh, not Sweden. I get those kind of, all those countries confused. Finland. So a lot of these rifles were sent to Finland during the Winter War. So the way you could tell this one doesn't have it, on this one side there'd be a SA and a block. And that's the way it's Finnish, I mean Finnish for Finnish Army. Mm. It's very oh, cool. Oh, okay. But yeah, they were sent to Finland, multiple countries. So the king of the Mausers, huh? Mm. Now you said that was primarily because of the, how smooth the action was, just how smooth the action it was made. It's, it's a cock on close, so not standard Mauser action you would yeah. think of. Well, this has been made by Mauser Company. Made by Mauser Company, yeah. Okay. When, when I like, uh, if you look at any late, 1800s Mauser, the machine work on them is just incredible. E- everything's stamped, numbers matching. I mean, look look at the machine work on that follower. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's beautiful. Yep. And then the the uh, the crest on the follower even is just yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty fantastic. Wow. A lot of really nice, um, you know, again custom builds done on on a Gustav. So that's ah, oh, they mm. they are a nice rifle. Fine cartridge too. As far as six fives go, very smooth shooting. Yeah. Very light recoil. If you if you want a if you want a high step and six five cartridge, uh, look no further than the uh, the six. And they're five They're still suite. making, I believe, modern guns and still in six. Oh, five absolutely. Suite. I think Remington right. was doing them for a while. And yep. Oh, fine gun, fine gun. Funny thing Every I like about it, looks... the bayonet looks like something you'd see out of an automotive shop. Yeah, it's, it's got kind of a weird like pin oh, system yeah. at the bottom. It's it's yeah. weird, very What's that weird, now? very modern, huh? very modern. The bayonet. Yeah, I mean, it's got like a little button that this. Oh. I mean, sure the, enough. I'm mean, look at that. You had not that from the 1800s. Right. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And look at the steel on that bayonet. I mean, it's just incredible. Amazing. Again, uh, quite a fighting tool. Ah, very yeah. nice. They put a lot of time and engineering into their stabbing sticks. They blood, did. <laughs> blood channel as well yeah. on that one. And now for probably the yeah, coolest ahead. rifle on the rack. What's that now? Oh, the K31. I've been so excited. Yes. Oh, here. Sorry. We got you stuck. We're attached to wires here in the in the range. I don't even know if we mentioned that, but we are in the range. Hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we might, we're going to do a little shooting after this. Hope we get some video and stuff of this. So this is probably my favorite rifle. Okay, this is, um, a, this is a pretty badass So rifle. this is a Swiss K31. This follows in another whole family line of rifles. 
Um, they first had the 1886, then 1896, and then the K11. This has a little bit different action, but this is a 7.5 by 55 Swiss. I believe is standard, yeah, standard 308 bullet. Um, a straight pull, so not a standard bolt action, but it's a straight mm, pull. Action. That always freaks me out, man. I think, I, I remember you were saying works. how you think the Manlicker Schoenhauer. Yeah, yeah. I think this could give a run for its power. Oh, no. He's just this one's dog. very smooth. Oh, they are. They're, this one is very smooth. Uh, this is no doubt faster. No, yeah, you're correct. Yeah. I mean, you're you're borderlining the speed achievable with a semi-auto with a, with a good rifleman. Another thing, All these right, were yeah. never meant to be detachable box mags, but magazine is very easy to get out. Um, but yeah, they were given stripper clips. Once again, they, we're going to make it detachable and never use it. I've exactly. got I've got it a Remington Ot 6 pump. That yeah. has a mag that I, you'd be hard pressed. I feel like if you set it side by side with that yeah. thing, I think what was wasn't the game master had a very similar mag. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. something like that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, these. I think are, that's what it, I think that's what it is. Seventy six hundred or something like that. Seven sixty. Seven sixty. Some, someone's got to explain it to me definitively, uh, and maybe other people out there feel like I do. Straight pull bolts. How is it that when you shoot, it doesn't blast back and punch your face out? Cam lever. Cam lever, yeah. You got a cam, and then you got huge lugs. Well, show him, how, show him when you, how you, when you push the bolt, how the bolt so, actually rotates. So, so a watch. cam lever, almost so similar to that of like your charging handle on an AR, with like yeah. a, a very mini yeah. version, is that? So you see, how you can see the serial number. Yeah, let me lock it all yeah, yeah. See how the serial number's at the very yeah, twelve o'clock position. Sure. You see how it fell down to the side a little bit. Yeah. That bolt's actually rotating. The bolt rotates. When you did what? When, when I pulled the disengage the cam. Oh, when I disengage okay, that cam. Comes back yeah. a little bit. You can see how it kind of turns. Yeah. Counterclockwise. So it's a locking bolt. So it's a locking. It Twisted. locks into that position. Wow. So it's a very sweet shoot. And you can see. And what year was this invented? So this one, in the thirty K31 was invented uh, in 1931. Okay, it makes sense. Um, but they were made all the way through the war and mm -hmm. after the war. 1931, they were making stuff like that. I mean, the, the mines that had to go into making stuff so like this. So this one, I believe, is a post-war. Yeah, it's post-war. You can tell by the stock. It's a birch stock instead of a walnut. Mm -hmm. But it still fits the. What's the um? What's the the little ring? Yeah, the ring. So that's your back. basically kind of like your cocking piece that you'd have on your uh, infields and your O threes. Oh, I yeah. So like this back here, that's is that yeah, you that's and your, it's your firing, safety. That's and your firing pin. So it's your firing pin, uh, but also it's also the safety. Okay. So what you do is you pull it out, and you turn it. Safe. Hmm. Clockwise. That's safe. So I can, and then I pull it back. And Absolutely fire. brilliant. It's insane. It's very similar, kind of like the Mosins. It's kind of you pull out and turn to the side. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you you shot this brilliant. one. Yes. This is my favorite, one of my favorite does it, rifles. Does it shoot very high? No, mine really? Yeah. Uh, when yeah. we first sighted in, yeah, it was very Everything high. Everything back was, then was a 300-yard battle yeah. site. Zero, yeah. And I don't know why. It's just, yeah. This one actually this one goes down to 100 yards. What's really neat about these, being that they never were using a combat, they're all in great style, yeah. shape. Especially the Most wear you ever find on them is on the lower four inches. Where they were put into racks and stuff? Racks not only that, the guys, they were using an alpine troop, so they all had snow cleats on. They'd snap their boot on that, and this pile of the stock would get warm from when they were cleaning their boots off. Oh. <laughs> and, like you mentioned, the soldier's name in it. Yeah. When they were issued, because they always took their rifles home, they put it on a piece of paper a lot of times, that soldier's name that was underneath the butt stock. Yeah, so if you yeah. buy one, that's the first thing you do is take it off see the Exactly. Soldier. I remember this my brother did, and he wound up trying to figure out who it was, yeah. find him, you know. Unfortunately, we didn't have one. Yeah, this is, I, I would assume this is probably one of the family ones. A lot of times families were given these rifles. Okay. So, yeah, this is probably one of the, a family one that they would have had. Yeah. It's pretty, very sweet shooting. It's pretty funny when you think about those guys back then, just, ah, I'm going to clean off my boot with this thing, you know, and it's like, it, you wonder what firearms now, it's where, you know, people <laughs> just rattle can them a million times with pain or, you know, or do whatever with them or, and people in the future will be like, oh, it's all beat up because some, you know, <laughs> jack wagon was using it this way or, yep. it's another a tool reason, at the time. Another reason why the Switzerland, Swedish have never, Swiss have never been in a war is because, they are very, very, very proud of their marksmanship in their country. Everybody from a young age is taught to shoot. Majority of the, the young gentlemen fight in the army or in the military. Um, so it's and there, there's ranges all over. If is you that watch, mandatory si assignment. I don't know if it's mandatory. I know like Korea, South Korea is mandatory for all men. A certain age is mandatory. I'm not 100 percent sure on hmm. the Swiss. 
Very, very proud shooting culture, though. Yeah. Very, sh- especially so, where, they're, where they're located at. You would think with that kind of a shooting culture that, you know, you'd be like, oh, we can take anybody on, you know, and I mean, I mean they, be kind of get a They're bit- a small country, and they're, you can get across their country really quickly, much like Finland. Finland is very similar in, in the way they do that. Like my former employer was Finnish Army Mandatory Service. Uh, he was an artilleryman. They still hold submachine gun competitions there. Like we hold USPSA competition. So if you want to go shoot a submachine gun competition, you go to Finland, you go to Sweden, you go to Norway. Um, and marksmanship is like we watch football on Sundays. Yeah. They go have 300 meter shoots. So we think of where does like the 6.5 by 47 Lapua come from? It was a, a cartridge designed for shooting sports in Finland. Um, like we would play football. So a lot of those Nordic countries, uh, or Scandinavian countries, that that heritage runs very, 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 very deep. Another thing, is, their ammo is yeah. just incredible. Yeah. The GP11, the, yeah. the man standard military ball ammo is like match quality ammo. Yep, that you shoot through this. It's I'm, I've gotten wow. inch groups at 200 yards with yeah. this, no problem. With all irons. day with yeah. irons. So when people say something is Swiss made, that's kind of what they're yeah. they like a Swiss make. watch right on the dot, Swiss Army knife, everything. Wow. Swiss chocolate. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I wonder. You, you know, you think know. you think about like, yeah, that strong shooting culture, yeah. and yet they've yeah. never not, never not, they never not been in no war. Um, but I mean, is that just a like a defensive mindset? Like, hey, we're not going to get in the fray, but if we did, we would do a fine job of. If we did, or picking, picking if you want to come through here, you might have to. Yeah. Do some work. Yeah. yeah. Man, I don't know. What an I'm gonna ask. What an assortment here. It was something. Thank you guys for yeah, this. No stuff. problem. No problem. This is this is the coolest thing. It's been very like, enjoyable. Like we said to everybody listening out there, this is a listener special. You know, Nick Nick is a listener of the podcast and joined us because he had some cool stuff to tell us. And Ray, thanks for coming out. No problem. Uh what, what do you say? You we'll let you guys do a uh since we're since we're already over an hour and a half here. I mean, it is well worth it because we talked about some awesome stuff. Uh Nick and Ray, you guys want to want to close it out with any any final uh, last calls, final thoughts, or anything like that? No, I appreciate you having us. Very enjoyable, and uh, we're always this is what we're here for. We like showing our toys off. So. <laughs> awesome, Jim. Awesome. Hey, Jim, can I ask one question before oh, I go? Heck yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've been talking about a lot of history here, right? And we touched on you guys doing those reenactments, which I think would be a very live action portrayal of this history. Do people come and spectate these? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. There's, and especially from where you guys here up in Wisconsin, there's not one far away, about maybe an hour Rockford, in Rockford. Rockford. Okay. Which yeah, yeah. is, I think, now one of the l- if largest. If not the, it's the second largest. Second largest in the world. Are you guys going to. Really? How we, often does it take place, and are you guys um, going to be Rockford at it? Rockford goes on every year in. Third week in September. Third week in September, I believe. We don't go to it because we're a little too far south. Darn it. But. Um, what Rockford is a great one, especially for Chicago people from Chicago, uh, North, Southern Wisconsin. But you have people from all over the country come to it. Cool thing about Rockford is they have it's a museum that owns the property, but they have a like an occupied French village, a block of a French village, and they have battles on them, and it's really cool. Oh, so he's, seriously? Yeah, they have like a little cafe. A little I mean, thing. it's. They're speaking German. They're driving German half tracks around. There's German tanks. There's American tanks. It's incredible. I mean, it's like stepping back to 1940. Oh, my gosh. And there, it's not so something that's centrally located in the Midwest. There's all the way from California to the northeast to the south. Um, like, there's, depending on where you're at, like in Ohio, they have a, up in northeastern Ohio, up on the one of the lakes, they have what, like, a, basically a D-Day landings. Mm-hmm. It's, it's awesome. They come on actual Higgins boats. It's really cool. Down in Texas, they have the National, I think, National Pacific Museum down there. They have multiple dugout trenches built up. You have, like, uh, Marines versus Japanese. You know, and and a lot of people think it's just big people playing cowboys and Indians, and it kind of is, but it's more to honor the veterans that died Mm -hmm. for us years ago. Yeah. And and a lot of times they'll have a a veteran will come there, and they're treated like royalty. They ride them to the battlefield in a Jeep. They get a special seat. They get announced to the crowd. I mean, it's there to honor them. Oh, yeah. And then, like, we we hear stories. You'll have a veteran... For instance, like in the group we re, uh, portray, the 325th Glider, 82nd Airborne, there was a gentleman and that we, we don't know him personally, but a couple guys in our group knew from St. Louis area that was actually in the 325th Gliders that would come and talk to us and tell us stories of what actually happened to that the same unit that we mm-hmm. portray 
during the war. And yeah. it's, it's very wild, interesting. It's pretty amazing. It's such an important part of, of history to understand where you come from, you know, and what, what your country's had to go through yeah. to get to where it is. And it's and being that a lot of World War II is so far along, you know, not too many people really remember that. Now they're starting to portray Vietnam because a lot of those guys okay, are in their yeah. 60s and stuff. Yeah. So they're they're getting honored now. Yeah. Well, it's about time those guys got on. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and they, and they yeah. didn't I mean, get geez. that warm welcome home that a lot of the World War II guys did. So right, it's... right. Well, hey, yeah, it, it's super cool. I'm glad you asked that question too, Mark. Yeah, it was a good question. But, yeah. Thank you. I was curious. Yeah. Any other final calls before we, uh, no, no, before we close this I'm thing good. out? Well, hey, like we said, guys, uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, if you have anything else that you have really interesting that you'd like to talk about with us on the podcast, we would absolutely love to hear it. And, uh, yeah, anything. Guns, hunting, shooting, comp- competitions related to any of those things, uh, anything of the sort. And, uh, yeah, guns are cool. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.